Okay, well, um, thank you everybody for showing up today. I know some in some places that you're sitting, it's not the best time of the day. Uh, like I said, my name is Mark Deluzio and, uh, and I'm going to uh, take you through uh, a session on standard work. Why am I doing this? Well, you know, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about standard work. Uh, it really is one of those tools that kind of got just, like a lot of parts of Lean, everybody says, you know, Lean is, is pretty standard, pretty basic, pretty uh, 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 common sense. But I think you all know that it's, it, there's a lot of nuances to, to, to Lean and uh, it's not as straightforward as somebody might think. There's a lot of nuances that a lot of people miss. And this is one of those tools quite frankly, that, uh, that, that, that falls into that category. Okay, so I wanna to try to really um, teach the way I learned it and the way you know, a couple other people on the call, uh, Clem and some of the other people have learned it. And I'm trying to bring you pretty much the unaltered version of the way we were taught by a group called Shinga Jitsu, which were, were formed by the original guys that were the handpicked lieutenants of Tashiono. And they all formulated and, and perfected the Toyota production system many, many years ago. Unfortunately, some of those guys aren't with us anymore. And the cow is, and I'm gonna talk about him a lot. Uh, Iwata had passed away quite some time ago. Uh, so so uh, I, wanna, I wanna try to just take you through and answer a lot of your questions uh, on this. Now, understand that the only way that you're gonna really learn this is by going out and doing it. <clears throat> uh, and uh, that really is the only, you can't learn to play golf by watching Tiger Woods, right? Uh, you have to go out and pick up the club and do it yourself, right? So, so that's something to keep in mind here. So I'm gonna try to convey some tacit knowledge here. I've got some people on the call that are extremely good at this. As a matter of fact, they helped me uh, put this together uh, and reviewed it for me and told me where I was wrong. Uh, and uh, so, as a matter of fact, let's just start with that. And I'd like to I'd like to go to the first slide and just thank these people. Uh, Colleen, I know, is on the call. I think Davey said he was going to be on the call. I'm not sure John will be there. I think he's in a meeting. Steve might be. I didn't see John uh, Steve come in, but anyway. These people, Clem, Clem and I worked together at Danaher for, geez, I don't know, since the mid-90s sometime. And uh, Clem was part of helping me build the Danaher business system. And as a matter of fact, uh, Clem actually brought value stream mapping to Danaher. Uh, so we weren't using it until Clem got there. And uh, so uh, that's one of many things that Clem could be credited with. But I don't want to give him a big head, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, Colleen has done a lot of great work with standard work and uh, has really, I think, you know, understood the essence of what this is all about. Uh, Davey, of course, he's one of the pioneers in Europe that brought Lean to Europe through his work with Nissan. John, um, John, John's unbelievable. He told me when I first met him, matter of fact, introduced by Colleen, he said to me, yeah, when I went to work for Lexus, my first three months, I had to stand in the same spot and I couldn't move. That's all I did for the first three months. Uh, remember the old saying that Yogi Berra said, you can observe a lot just by watching. Well, John not only watched, but he heard, he smelled, and he watched, right? Steve has been a thought partner with me as long with John Foster and Patrick Ross out of Australia. Uh, these three guys have been uh, unbelievably uh, fantastic in their contribution with, with the thinking and, 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 and just adding on to the knowledge base. And then of course, Clem, who you know, kind of is my sidekick from such a long time ago. And, uh, and so, uh, so I, uh, and Clem works for, for uh, Lean Horizons, uh, my company. Um, so that's where we are. These people contributed to help me with, with this, this presentation and add a lot of great content and thought to this. So I just wanna thank them all. So why do I do this? Uh, this is Mr. Nakao, okay. Uh, one of the most influential guys in my career and uh, you can hear me talk a lot about Nakao throughout this presentation. Uh, but he's also known as, you know, the father of, uh, of Moonshine. And uh, this is him and I back in 2017. I hadn't seen him in many, many years. And he asked to see me. 
Uh, this is in a restaurant, one of my favorite restaurants in Connecticut. However, um, I was living in Arizona. So when I got the call, he wanted to see me. I said, geez, you know, but I thought so much of him that I flew to Connecticut just to have dinner with him from, uh, from Arizona. So uh, he said to me, one, one day I asked him about Tashi Ono, who he idolized. And, and, uh, and nobody ever asked him the question, hey, what's, what's Ono's son like? And he actually sat there at the Japanese restaurant in Simsbury, Connecticut, and tears came down his eyes. And uh, he, uh, he left the table. And he came back about you know, five minutes later and said to me, Deluzio son, would you like to hear about Ono son? I said, yeah. So I just sat there with my mouth shut for the next almost hour. And he just told me stories. I wish I could have recorded it, but he told me stories about Ono. But at the end of all the stories, and maybe someday I got to record that somehow through memory. But at the end of the story, uh, at, when he got done, he said to me, Deluzio son, you are a, a disciple of Tayashi Ono. You must dedicate your life to teaching his word. Okay. The purity of his word. Okay. And I took that very seriously. And when I, I finally saw him in uh, 2017, he said to me, Deluzio son, you're the only one from Danaher who carried on with uh, Ono's word, which isn't totally true, but I'm not going to argue with him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so he asked me to actually sponsor a, uh, a study mission in Japan with him. And that was a big honor for me because it was like, geez, that's like, you know, Muhammad Ali asking me to be a sparring partner, you know? And, uh, but what happened was schedule changes and everything. And then COVID hit, we just didn't get it done. So I am going to try to get one done next year with him. I'm talking to them now uh, in 2022, provided everything's kind of, you know, relaxed in terms of the COVID restrictions. But anyway, uh, this guy is probably one of the most unbelievable mentors I've ever had. And uh, I can't say enough about the guy. Okay. So I really, when I'm on spending all that time on LinkedIn, you know, talking about the purity of this, this, he's the guy, he's the reason I'm doing it. Okay. And I really have a passion for making sure that Ono's word gets spread the correct way. And that's what this presentation is all about. Okay. Okay. So um, this is what we're going to go through today. Um, we're going to go through um, the introduction. I'm going to talk about the elements of standard work. You know, talk about cycle time because it's a big ball of confusion when people look at that. Then I'm going to get into the documentation and then uh, maybe have time to talk about some questions and maybe open up for some of your questions as well. Uh, maybe we'll just do that and skip step five because you'll be able to read that later. And then there's an appendix with all kinds of good stuff back there too that you can take a look at later. So Nakao once said to me, what you're seeing on the left here is the Toyota Production System House as you know, originally uh, written by, by, uh, by Tashi Ono, okay? And I don't know how many companies I go into that say they're doing lean. And of the five things that are on here, the just-in-time principle, Jadoka, Hijunka level scheduling, standard work, and Kaizen, hardly any of those are being done. But you know we have really nice yellow lines on the floor. We have electronic uh, uh, software to do value stream mapping. Uh, we have Gemba boards that we don't really know what to do with at the end of the day because most of them are really misused because we don't know how to solve problems. And so we just record data, but do nothing with it. But it looks like we're doing lean, right? But when I go into a company and they tell me they're doing lean and they're not doing standard work, game's over, okay? And, and, and Nicole told me, if you don't understand, really understand standard work, you don't understand the Toyota production system because there's so much philosophy in this one tool, okay? Now, keep in mind that this tool isn't looked at as just a tool in, at Toyota. It's looked at as an eclectic uh, set, a, a bunch of Venn diagrams. They don't look at all these tools compartmentalized. That's a consulting industry. That's what we do. We go out and sell our tools. Well, that doesn't make sense because if I want to build a house, I'm not going to come to you and sell you my skills, you know, and building a hammer and using a hammer. So, so they look at it differently. It's a very eclectic approach, which is a little bit different thinking than, uh, than what you, you might see from a lot of consulting companies. So 
this is a busy slide and it's not meant for me to sit here and read it all, but let's just talk about a couple key things on this, okay? Um, uh, what, what is standard work, right? Uh, well, let's first of all talk about what it's not. It's not a traditional time and motion study. And there are reasons for that because the typical time and motion study typically didn't look at flow, didn't look at combining what we call a work sequence, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit when we get to the elements. Um, it's not designed to eliminate jobs or make operators work harder, okay? It's not any of this stuff, okay? It's not standard operating procedures. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. David Thompson helped me out with that one. Um, it's, it's, it's not an engineering exercise. A lot of people think it is, okay? Uh, a way to punish the operator. So typically this, in a nutshell, standard work is a way that we document the one best way that we've observed, okay? the one best way that we observed, not made up, not done in some engineering office three miles away. We observed the one best way. Now the question is, can we hit that one best way every time? And of course the answer is usually no, which basically the difference between that one best way and your actual performance are your opportunities for Kaizen on a priority basis. So why would you not hit your standard work? Well, machine goes down. Maybe I need to think about TPM. Supply problems, quality problems. I mean, go through the list, litany of things that could happen, right? So, so you know, when you, when you, when you look at that, um, you say to yourself, well, standard work really is that one tool that will, you know, uh, identify all these, all these issues, okay? Now, one of the things that people say, well, you know, standard, lean doesn't apply because I can't do standard work. Why? Because oh, I'm a job shop, right? Oh, really? Okay. Well, it does have to be a repetitive operation in order for standard work to apply, which by the way, uh, also works in admin type processes, whether you're taking an order, paying an invoice, whatever, okay? It's got to be a repetitive process, all right? And, uh, but even in a job shop, I've had conversations where I say, well, okay, well, you got a welding department. Yeah, and, but we weld all kinds of different things. But okay, well, wait a minute. Is your welding the same? I mean, is a weld a weld a weld no matter what you're doing it on? Yeah, for the most, most part. Well, why don't, we, why don't we calculate tack time based on the number of welds you got to do every day? Take your production plan, lay it into number of welds, and then record welds as your unit of measure, not units, okay? So there's ways to do this, creative ways to do this. But you can see I highlighted in this Tech time, standard work and process and work sequence. Those are the three elements that I'm gonna talk about. So again, I, I'd like you to, you know, when you, when you take this presentation later off of YouTube, really study this slide and, and look at this and, and try to really understand it. And obviously let me know if there's questions, but there's a lot of misnomers about what this is all about. And, uh, and you know, it is one of the three elements on the base of the Toyota production system house. And again, uh, I would argue that if it does apply to your business and you're not doing it, you're not doing it. I don't care how many gimbal boards you have up and I don't care how many posters you put up, how many yellow tapes on the floor you have, you're not doing lean if you're not doing standard work, okay? So we'll get back into that in a minute. So here's a way to think about standard work, okay? From the people, oh, sorry. I kind of messed up the, the slide there. Uh, from the people, process, uh, instructions, and rhythm, okay? I'm going to take you over to the orchestra first on the right-hand side. What would you think an orchestra would sound like if I didn't have sheet music? Okay, so we do a good job with the operators. We train our musicians. They all know how to play great music, great instruments. We set it up, the instrument layout, right? We set up all the percussion in one spot and the flutes and the the brass and all that. And then we have sheet music and we have a conductor that keeps the beat. How many times have you seen a cell created, whether it's right or wrong, created in your manufacturing or in your office environment and you didn't put the sheet music in? Well, how are you gonna get good music out of that cell 
if you don't have the sheet music. Well, that's the sheet music happens to be standard work. Okay. So it's analogous to setting up an orchestra with no sheet music. Good luck with making that sound good. Okay. Well, good luck with making your cell consistently producing to, again, that one best way, right? And then of course we have this whole notion of tech time, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, which is the rhythm or the beat of, 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 uh, of, of, of that cell, no different than the conductor's beat. So think about standard work related to an orchestra. The one thing you're gonna find out about me is that I always like to relate to real life, okay? And uh, because really a lot of what we do with our own lives so much is in, in accordance with lean principles. But when we, we kind of turn our brain off when we walk into, wor into work, and then fundamentally we, we, we're measured in ways such that we don't act that way anymore, right? Whether it be you know, volume purchases, because we're gonna get a discount on price, buying stuff from 5,000 miles away, which makes no sense on lead time. Uh, you wouldn't do that stuff personally, but we do do it in the business, okay? so. So uh, you're going to see, I'm going to always be thinking about real life examples that we can all relate to, right? Uh, here are the three elements, uh, tack time, work sequence, and standard work, okay? And I'm going to take you through this relatively quickly, but uh, <laughs> tack time, how often a part or service should be produced based on the rate of demand, Okay. Uh, work sequence, the specific sequence assigned to the operator, okay? The manual steps in which the operator has to perform. And then standard working processes, that designated amount of inventory needed to keep operators flowing within their work sequence. So I'm going to get into each one of these. If it's not clear to you by these definitions, I think it will be when we get done here. So, so let's talk about tack time, okay? Um, tack time if you look down below, is the pace of sales in the marketplace. That's Toyota's definition, okay? Pretty interesting. Um, people say, well, tack time doesn't apply to me. Well, newsflash, whether or not you want to recognize tack time or not, you've got a tack time, okay? If you can't figure it out, okay, that's one thing. But don't say you don't. it doesn't apply. It's there. It's kind of like saying, you know, well, geez, the, uh, the weather doesn't affect me. Yeah, it does. I have no control over that. Well, you have a tack time. Whether or not you want to perform to that tack time or not is, is, is up to you, but I will tell you it's to your demise if you, if you don't. Okay, so uh, hang on for a minute. All right, so tact um, is often confused with cycle times, which I'm gonna get into lead time, process time, all these other times and I've heard it misused all the time. I was talking to, a, I was interviewing somebody for a consulting job one time at Danaher. And uh, the guy said to me, uh, yeah, I did a really great job taking our tech time down. Really? Yeah, I proved productivity. Wow, you took tech time down. So you must be in sales. What do you mean? Well, you, uh, you must have increased the volume to get your tech time down because a, a, a lower tech time means it's a faster tech time, which means you have more volume. You'll see that in the math in a minute, okay? So, so uh, it, it's, it's confused all the time, right? So let's get into uh, uh, what, we're, what we wanna, wanna talk about here. Um, sorry about that. Sorry, a little bit of user error here on the uh, control here. A Little bit of history, it's the introduced, believe it or not, tech time's a German word, okay? It means beat or rhythm, right? Uh, Tack time is a German word, and it uh, and it came out of the war with Mitsubishi making aircraft for the Germans, and this was the beat that they had to make those airplanes. Okay, uh, it's interesting to look back at the Japanese company, whether it be Datsun, David Thompson, and I were talking about this yesterday, or Toyota, how the war had such an impact on these companies, which is a whole other subject for another day. But, but. Uh, it means a precision or an interval of, I, I'm sorry, I keep, I keep hitting this, uh, this control and I gotta stop that, sorry. Um, interval of time, okay, so think about it as the metronome in a, in a musical beat, which is why I said the conductor was that guy, right? He was, the, he was the guy that keeps the beat. And that's 
what you should be looking at when you're thinking about putting up a cell and creating flow and all that stuff, what's the beat of that cell? What's the rhythm, right? Now, some may say, well, geez, we only make one unit a day. Well, you you need to have a beat in the interim to do that. And this may be beyond the scope of, of this presentation, but but uh, it's something what I would call a, a when I walk into a, a factory, for example, I call it a tact image, right? What what exactly is the beat? How do I feel about it? Can I feel it? Can I hear it? Can I sense it, right? Sometimes a little tough when you walk into an electronics type of company, you know, surface mount and all that, you don't get that because it's quiet, right? But there should be a beat. You should be able to see product moving. You should be able to see some kind of beat going on. If everything's stagnant and staying still, you don't have that tact image, okay, which you, you're really going to need, all right? Now, I was told by Nakao that Tashiono insisted that tack time be written in red. And you're gonna see throughout this presentation and any other thing that we do, tack time will always be written in red. Why? He thought it was the most important number going and he wanted to highlight that number all the time to make sure it's delineated between all the other numbers that you might be looking at, okay? So you're gonna see that even when we draw tack time on a combination sheet, it's red, okay? And, uh, and, and, and so that's, something I've always honored, uh, again, in, this, in the spirit of trying to teach Ono's uh, 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 you know, philosophy and, 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 and concepts, if you will, right? So we always, matter of fact, I got yelled at many times by Nikau. He would fire me several times a day when I wouldn't write tack time in red. I think Clem probably got that too uh, with, uh, with Nikau. So, uh, so anyway, that was that. The calculation, and again, I'm gonna to spend too much time on this, but we start with gross available time. So here I'm using an easy example of eight hours, right? 3,600 seconds gives me 2,800 seconds. Uh, less breaks, so we give two paid breaks, 30 minutes, take that out. We sometimes would deduct things like team meetings. If you have a five minute meeting at the beginning of the shift, yeah, we take that out. Some companies have cleanup time at the end of the shift, 10 minutes, let's say, we take that out. But I would never ever allow cleanup time to be deducted from available time if you didn't have a standard procedure as to who did what at the end of the shift. Otherwise, it's an excuse for you to put your coat on and wait 10 minutes before the clock hits the bottom of the hour, right? So, so uh, those are things. Now, so we have available time, and I'm gonna get to some other comments in a minute on this, but we have the available time, 27,000 to produce. My demand in this case is 350. I have a tack time of 77 seconds, okay? And I'll get to what, how we use tack time in a minute and why we use it the way we do. Now, people may say, hey, what about the machine downtime? No. How about uh, if the line goes down because uh, the supplier shorted us? No, you don't take that time out. Uh, how about the fact that uh, uh, changeover? Well, we have changeovers. No, no, we view changeovers as an abnormality, okay? Hey, we normally work, We've been working 10 hours a day because of demand. Uh, we should use 10 hours to calculate, not eight. No, because if you, unless you view overtime as a normal situation, it's technically should be looked at as an abnormal situation, right? Uh, so, so no. Now there may be some companies that work four 10 hour shifts. Okay, I agree with that. You can use 10 hours there. But if you say, hey, we normally have been working 12 hours a day, so I'm gonna use 12 hours. No, okay. This, the thing, one of the big misconstrued notions about tech, about uh, uh, standard work is people want to put all of their abnormalities into the document, into the math, so that they don't have any deviations. And the whole idea is to look at what really is normal versus abnormal and not allow the abnormal stuff in. So you're going to draw that line in the sand that says, this is how we should be operating if I didn't have these abnormalities, including changeover, by the way. Changeover is an abnormality if it takes you, you know, four hours to change over, okay? So, so we don't wanna document all the mess ups that you got going on now. The whole idea is to get rid of those mess ups and if I don't make them visible with standard work by putting that one best way that we know today, and by the way, that one best way may have waste in it, okay? But, but if we don't put that one best way in, okay, I'm never gonna highlight 
the deltas or the differences between that one best way and what's really going on today, right? So keep that in mind, okay? Everybody wants to bake this in so they don't look bad. And if you don't have the culture where, you know, you're not rewarded for bringing problems to the surface, then this is going to be a problem for you because uh, so many companies I walked into spend so much time hiding their waste and making themselves look good internally. But at the end of the day, the person who's really going to judge you is your customer. You can't hide from your customer. You can, you can mark yourself green all you want on all your charts and all your gimbal boards. But if your customer thinks you stink, guess what? You stink, okay? And so keep that in mind. We don't want to bake in abnormalities in any of this math or any of these, any of these uh, documents, okay, uh, as, we, as we go through, all right? Okay, so how do we use tack time? I put this chart together just to say, hey, there's really three ways to think about tack time, at least, there may be more. Um, and, um, and so people, operators required. When we take the sum of the operator cycle time, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit later in the presentation, what that means, okay? The total amount of time it takes to produce that part in that cell and by the way, tech time is, you know, when, when, you, when you look at learning to see with uh, Womack and John Shook's uh, book, they have a plant level tech time. I, I, and that was just for simplicity, so for teaching purposes, right? But, but hardly ever did I see one tech time applied to the whole plant. It, it really got to be looked at by cells. For, for example, if I have a cell that makes uh, ballpoint pens and I have another one that makes, let's say, magic markers, well, first of all, the demand is going to be different. Okay, so right there, I'm going to have a different tech time. I might have a value stream that has a shared operation. So let's just say that uh, my demand for this one value stream is 100 per day, but it has to go through a shared operation where another value stream is, is sharing that equipment. Well, that piece of equipment, the tech time is different, right? Because uh, it may have a, a demand of 200 on that machine even though the value stream has 100. So, so you've got to think about tack time locally as it relates to you know, whatever you're looking at to improve and where you're looking to, you know, to uh, apply, uh, in this case, standard work, okay? So what you do is in that relative area, in this case, let's just say it's a cell, I take the total amount of cycle time that it takes to build one unit and I divide it by the tack time that gives me the number of people that I need, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so if I have a 500 second uh, uh, cycle time and 100 second tack time, I need five people, okay? Now, I'll get into a little bit later, a little more finite, you know, what do you do with, uh, with partial people, okay? Uh, you don't cut off their legs, you don't cut off their arms, okay? We tried that once, it didn't work. Uh, no. uh, so, uh, uh, so that's one thing, uh, how you calculate the people that are required. Inventory, you're working, if you take your lead time, and I'll get into this thing about curtain effect in a minute. If you take your lead time for that part, okay, divided by the tack time, that's how many pieces of whip you need. So in other words, if I have an outside process uh, and it takes, you know, 60 minutes on that outside process to, to, to process and return to the cell, okay, and my tack time is a minute, well, in that cell, then I need 60 pieces. My tack time, one minute into, into, uh, into 60 minutes, okay? And you'll see that a little bit later. And then last but not least, uh, and, and I'll get to this in, in a lot more detail as well, the processing capacity of a piece of equipment. When you take the machine cycle time plus the load and the unload time, which comes out of the operator cycle time, you, uh, it has to be within tack time. Otherwise, you'll have a bottleneck within that cell, okay? And, uh, and, and, and obviously, you won't be able to uh, to make your demand in those, in that 27,000 seconds or whatever time you happen to come up with there, okay? So, so that's three ways you could use uh, tech time, okay? So big conversation about what's allowed and what's not allowed in available time, okay? We do not allow you to deduct everything in red, okay? And you say, well, Mark, that's not fair. What about fatigue? What about, well, if you're going to process that are fatiguing your, operation, your operators, that's an abnormality. And you got to do something about that. 
I remember Nikal telling me the manufacturing engineer's number one job is to make it easy for the operator. That's it. Not to be on a computer, not to do CAD drawings, not to do uh, electronic value streams, not to do uh, uh, any other kind of stuff. Or, you know, he used to call the engineers sometimes uh, 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 catalog engineers because all they would do is order solutions out of a MacMaster ca car catalog. He hated catalog engineers. As a matter of fact, he'd come up to you during the day and ask you to see your hands. And if they weren't dirty, he'd fire you. And I used to get fired a lot, okay? Uh, so, so that's one thing. These things we don't allow because they're, you know, they're all, and now the bathroom breaks, you say, oh, well, how are you gonna help somebody not take, take a bathroom break? Well, this is where a lead of the cell would come in and take the place of that operator when he or she has to leave the cell, okay? Okay, so, uh, or, or let's say uh, an operator gets a call from home and says, hey, your, your daughter just got injured at school and she needs to take a phone call to talk to the nurse. Okay, unscheduled break, got that. We're not gonna be ridiculous about this, right? But, but you gotta cover that, okay? And then of course, any kind of downtime or quality problems, no, no, you can't say, hey, our yield is, uh, is, is 80%, so we're gonna factor all the time out by another 20%. No, you can't do that, okay? I wanna see that difference, right? And by the way, I'll get into this a little bit later, how you wanna run the cell versus how you document it are two different things. Paid breaks, team meetings, cleanup time. Again, I only allow cleanup time when, uh, when there's a documented process for that. And then problem solving. How many people wanna solve problems with your operators at the lowest level in the organization where the work really gets done, but you don't give them time to do it? Nuts, it's not gonna happen, okay? So uh, problem solving time is another category. There may be others, by the way, in here that you want to take out, but these are the standard ones that everybody talks about. Okay. Okay. So we got tack time. Now let's talk about work sequence. Okay. This is a second element of, uh, of standard work. Here's a cell. Uh, it's got what 11 operations in it. Okay. And by the way, notice that the cell is going counterclockwise. And I think some of you may know the reason for that, but the reason, the main reason is uh, most people are right-handed. So if you have equipment that you have to put your, you know, load and unload into any kind of equipment, you want your strong side going into the machine and you're flowing with your strong side. You're not working against your net, your un, you're going with your natural tendency of your body. You're not going, uh, against your natural inclination, unless you know, unless you are left-handed, but we set it up for the right-handed uh, operators because 90 plus percent of the people are are right-handed. That doesn't mean you can't hire left-handed people to do lean, okay? But that's how that's why we set it kind of. By the way, studies have shown, at least this is coming from Nikau, that it's a, a roughly a 10 percent productivity difference to have a counterclockwise cell versus a clockwise cell. Okay, so these are the work sequences. Now, when I did the math and figured out what my cycle time was, and I divided it by my tack time, in this case, it came out with three people, okay? So, so I've now looked at the operations and noticed that these operators are doing multiple operations. And one of the advantages of having a U-shaped cell is exactly this. You're cutting down the walk time because, I may not show it in this graph, but you're cutting down the walk time because you know most people who operate in a U-shaped cell load the operators linearly. So they'll go from uh, three to four to five to six instead of from uh, three to four to eight to nine. Okay, uh, uh, a little bit more advanced, but that's really one of the two or three reasons why you set up a U-shape, okay? The other is communication. A lot easier for these operators to talk to each other if there's a problem, as opposed to having this line extend way out. And I can't talk to operator at the 11th station because I'm at one and God, it's too darn long to bring to walk down there, right? That's another reason. The other is visual management. And you also bring your materials in and out at the same point. So there's a, a number of different reasons why the U is, uh, is, is important, okay? Uh, not a cell design, uh, this is not a cell design class, but that's one of the reasons. There's all kinds of other things that go along with that. But right now, that's just basic concept. So, um, so if, you look at, if you look at this cell now, uh, this should be set up in a one-piece flow, okay? 
So basically, when operator, uh, the second operator, let's say, gets done with stage, with his uh, fourth operation, that part gets picked up by the, the third operator, and he goes into five, six, seven, and hands it off to the other guy. Okay, so- Mark, yes. to interrupt you. Uh, are you presenting a PPT? Because I only see in your, your screen. Uh, you're talking. Uh, I can still see your screen. Is everybody having that problem? Can you guys all see my screen? I can, I can see your screen. I can see it. Yeah, I can yeah. see the power. Yeah, I can see it. You can't see it. Okay, I don't, I'm not sure. The problem might be on your end. Yeah, I've got a PowerPoint slide up right now. I can see it. Okay. Yeah, all good. You might want to try to maybe re, re reload Zoom or something and, and uh, sign back in. It thinks. Okay. Okay. Um, so anyway, you know, so. Now, the, the key here is that none of these operators could be over your tack time, okay? So let's just say, for example, I've got a tack time of uh, 1,000 seconds, and every operate, the first two operators are loaded at like the, right below that, let's say 980, 990. But that last, that, that third operator is loaded at, uh, is loaded at, uh, at 1,200 seconds. Well, what's my drop-off rate gonna be if I'm standing at the end of the cell? I'm not going to get one part every thousand seconds, like Tech Time says I should. It actually says I'm going to get one every 1,200 because the second operator is going to be waiting for the last guy. I can't have any operator cycle time over that time period. Now, the other thing is, oh, hey, we had a bunch of rework yesterday. Let's just throw that rework into the cell to have the operators fix it. No, no, that's not, that's not what you do with rework, okay? Rework needs to be looked at, not just to fix the problem, but to study it and understand root cause so that you can eliminate the problems. And a lot of times you're gonna find, especially with more complicated type designs, it's a design problem, it's not an operator problem. So now we're asking the operator to play, you know, hey, let's just, uh, you know, keep placing in and out the different components of an electronic board because I've got stack up tolerances and I, you know, I have supplier issues or a bad design. And yeah, most of the time it goes together, but this time it doesn't. I don't want the operators doing that. Okay. They're not rework specialists. Operators you're going to find should operate. Okay. So, so please keep in mind that once you interject other stuff, other than the demand for that day, you're not going to hit your tack time. And, and you can't treat, the, you got to treat these uh, operations as, production operations, not uh, scientific labs, okay? This is not a lab mentality. This is a production. That's why the tech time is so important. That's the pace that we have to keep this moving at, okay? Uh, and that's sometimes a big deal when you come out of a, a scientific or a, a pharmaceutical, let's say, product or, me or medical device that is in a lab environment, and now you're moving over to a production environment. Totally different game. And, and, and so a lot of the people that run these companies are in fact, you know, scientists and technical people that don't think about production. They think more in a lab mentality and that's just not good when you bring this into production. Okay, so, so, so keep that in mind as you go through. Okay, so again, the operator cycle time has to be within the context of, of tech time. And I will of course talk more about that as we move through. Okay, let's think about this again. I like to think about the fact that uh, bring it to real life, okay? Think about the work sequence that you assign the operator. In this case, this guy here has one, two, and three, okay? And he goes back to one. Like the racetrack in an auto race, whether you like Formula One, whether you like NASCAR, doesn't matter, okay? The racetrack is that, and who's the operator in that case? The driver, okay? The driver of that car, and isn't, it mandatory or paramount that we keep that driver on that track as long as we can, which basically means the driver shouldn't be changing his own tires, shouldn't be filling his gas tank up, right? That's what the pit crew does. So Nikau told me operators should operate. So, so if your standard work documentation has the work sequence laid out that says the operator is going to do step one through 10 or whatever it is, okay? 
And then you have them do all kinds of other stuff. Oh, let's let the operator go look for materials or look for tools or look for uh, or, or troubleshoot or do this or do that. No, no, that, that's, not, that's not in accordance with the philosophy, okay? Just like we wouldn't have a NASCAR or a Formula One driver or an Indy driver leave the track to do other things. So what do we do? We have a pit crew. Right, and this was all also analogous to changeover. By the way, we use this example in changeover as well. But the pit crew is analogous to what you know what well what we learned in Japan, the, the water spider. Some people call it material handler. That person is bringing materials to and from the line, tooling, any kind of supplies, whatever it is that the operators need to stay on their racetrack, which in this case is the work sequence. Okay, everybody looks at this indirect direct ratio of labor and looks at indirect as non-value added bull you tell the nascar driver or the indy driver we're going to cut your cost and we're going to eliminate your pit crew what do you think he's going to say okay you've got to have a racetrack mentality when you do production you've got to have a racetrack mentality when you do standard work and you can't have the you can't possibly expect the operators to be assigned a work sequence in accordance with attack time and then have them go do all kinds of other stuff. It's just not going to happen. Okay. So keep that in mind. And this was emblazed in my mind by Nakao. Operators should operate just like drivers should drive. Okay. Keep that in mind as a very important concept. All right. Everybody thinks they're being more productive by saying, I'm going to give the operator this to do and that to do. And they're going to do that too. And they're going to do that too. And we don't have to hire another person. And then you look at your production at the end of the day and you miss by 20% and you wonder, geez, why did that happen? Then you go pound on the operator and say, what's, what's wrong with you guys? Why don't you get the product out? Okay. No, this is, it's wrong. Okay. So, so keep that in mind. And by the way, the water spider should have a milk run with standard routines and a standard uh, uh, route that they are assured. And I'll talk about this in a minute when they talk about pitch using tack time, um, that the operator, the, the water spider should always assure that the operators are staying on that racetrack as much as possible, right? So that's that's a real key. Again, another analogy I want, like to use for you, okay? Uh, now the third element is standard work and process. And this one always gets kind of uh, confused, uh, but it's the designated amount of inventory needed to keep your operations flowing, okay? Tayashi Ono said, reducing work and process is not the objective. It is to expose problems. Now, what does he mean by that, right? A lot of people say, oh, let's put a bunch of inventory in WIP. So in case the machine goes down, I got something to work on. Well, kind of counter to the philosophy because what you want to do with work and process is standardize it. Like in this chart on the left, my standard work and process is nine, okay? And if I look in there and there's 15, 20, 30 pieces in there, I know I've got an abnormality. So something happened, okay? Either somebody's not performing to standard work, I had a machine downtime and somebody kept building, uh, either uh, who knows what, right? There could be all kinds of reasons why, but using standard, even standard work and process inventory is another way to detect abnormalities, okay? And, and, and once you know what that standard work amount is, you should be able to gauge when you have a problem, you see a buildup between two operations, for example, not good, right? So keep that in mind. And the, and, and the reason it's called standard is because it's what you say you want in there. And I'm not one of those lean guys that says, uh, we got to go to zero inventory. That'd be foolish. It'll be taking the blood out of your body, right? You've got to have some blood. You've got to have some fat. I've got more than I need, but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, you've got, you've got to have, Inventory is kind of like the blood line of your of your of your supply chain, right? And 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 so if you don't have that inventory, it's not good. You're gonna die. Okay. But the whole idea is to minimize it to what you say the standard is. And this is how we do it, right? So so that's a thought on, on standard work. By the way, I want to make one more point, which I didn't make back um, back here on, on, on this work sequence. And, and Patrick Ross out of Australia made this comment. Maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but when we don't have 
operations, uh, every operation is going to have its abnormalities, right? I don't care who you are, Toyota, I don't care who you are. But if, if, you, if you don't set this process up like standard work to address the abnormalities and through Kaizen on a priority basis, get rid of those abnormalities, that is a huge disrespect for people. So a lot of people say, oh, well, standard work, it's not fair. It's, I've had people tell me, gee, standard work is uh, inhumane to the operator because now you're putting them in a box and make them do the same thing all the time. Well, yeah, yeah, but when do you have a bad day at work? When things go right or when things go wrong? It's disrespectful for a leader to preside over, you know, huge quality problems, uh, huge uh, uh, equipment problems, design problems. I mean, it's just disrespectful to expect your people to consistently live that way without addressing the problems, okay? And, and Patrick Ross reminded me of that out of Australia, which I really appreciate because he said, oh, this, is a, this standard work is a lot bigger than just you know getting product out. Yeah, it, it is. It, it's tied into the whole respect for people concept, which you know I, I kind of knew that, but when Patrick brought it out, I said, oh man, how did I miss that, right? And I've been doing this for 30 years, right? So, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, thank you, Patrick, for that. I appreciate that. Uh, one other thing about the work sequence too, Davey Thompson reminds me that, uh, that you know, I, I, I like to do it in seconds. Davey likes to do it in, in actually fractions of seconds. Uh, but depending on the tack time, I think if you have a real long tack time, it may not be as relevant, but if you got a really short, let's say you have a 20 second tack time. Yeah, you know, really breaking those seconds down. So Davey prefers to do it that way, which is fine. Uh, you know, break it down into hundreds and all that. So, but at minimum, I like to see you use seconds some of my examples use minutes, probably shouldn't have done that, but, um, but I, I like to keep it. And by the way, it's a lot easier to add, subtract and divide by seconds than, than it is when you have a minute and a second type of thing. You always got to convert it, which is not good either. So, okay. So anyway, state of working concept uh, process, which is the third, uh, the third element of, of, of standard work. Uh, This is Toyota's definition of it. And I thank, thank Steve Feltovich for this because he, he brought this out to me the other day and said, hey, Toyota actually defines it, right? Standard work and process is the amount of material that is flowing through a process when work is proceeding smoothly. It is the minimum amount of material needed to maintain a smooth flow of production without accumulating inventories. Now, so that basically means that uh, when it's going smoothly, okay, and when you don't see the standard work in process, you see more. Again, it's a visual indicator that tells you you've got a problem somewhere and you gotta look into it, okay? All right. I won't spend too much time on this, but one of the ways you could use this with inventory is something we call the curtain effect, okay? So let's say in this diagram on the left, I've got a, uh, a process, process number one, and now the, now the part has to leave the cell. Let's say it has to go to heat treat or it has to go to black oxide or some outside process somewhere, right? Painting, plating, whatever. And then it's got to come back in to be continued to be processed. Well, I may not be able to, you know, bring a whole heat treat operation into the cell. Although we have put induction heating into the cell where we actually got rid of heat treating and really did it in one peaceful fashion. We've done that. We've done this with, uh, with uh, surface mount uh, we've done this with wave solder where we put the wave solder right in line in the cell rather than have a, a wave solder department. There's a lot of different things you could do to, 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 to Kaizen that out. Because one of the, like Nikau said, the hardest thing to do in lean is, is to really achieve pure flow, right? Which basically means the part never stops, okay? Now, when it does have to leave the cell, you've got this in and out thing. So what happens is the operator goes and processes the part uh, number one and the, the first operation and then drops it in the out basket and has already has inventory sitting there coming in so he can continue in his work sequence. He goes to three, then to nine, 10, you know, so, so, it, so the outside process does not allow you to, the operator to have to stop. Okay. Now, how do you do that? Well, if you take your lead time up on top of the outside process, in this case, I'm using 6,000 seconds. And I take my tack time, which let's say is uh, 120 seconds. 
and I divide that out, it means I need 50 units, okay? So those 50 units have to be sitting in that cell in the in basket. So if you look at my little chart in the middle here, you'll see that when I start the day, I've got zero in the out basket and 50 in the in basket. I do my first cycle and guess what? I now put one to go into the out basket and now there are only 49 in the, uh, in the, in the, in the in basket, right? And, and it continues on. And once that's depleted, the water spider should come over and bring in another group of 50 parts, okay? Um, so that I can continue going. And this is, again, we don't want that operator leaving the cell to go look for those parts, okay? That's what the water spider does, okay? Or material handler, whatever you want to decide. I had one company tell me that uh, water spider was demeaning to them. I don't know. I never had that only but once, but I kind of like it. You know, and, and by the way, the water spider, if you ever see a water bug on top of water on a pond and it jumps from one area to another, that's why they call it that. Sometimes they call it a water bug, uh, but, uh, but mostly it was referred to to us as a water spider. So that's what the pitch is. The pitch is 100 minutes, which is basically taking the two minute tack time times 50. The, the, uh, the, the, the water spider has 100 minutes to make sure they come back with the next group of 50 parts, okay? Now, whenever I've done this, I put a little of a little uh, safety factor in place. And why did I do that? Because I might add another 10 pieces because there may be timing issues with the water spider for whatever reason. Although you try to standardize that route as much as you can. So I always put a little bit of factor. It's not that big of a deal, but what you don't want to do is shut the line down, right? But I also don't want to add a thousand parts to the line either, okay? Uh, but you want to try to get that water spider on a pitch and on a routine where it's, that is as consistent as what the operator is doing, okay? All right. Now, we haven't talked about Kanban or flow or pull or anything like that, but, but if this is a true pull system and this line goes down for whatever reason, it will have a signal that those 50 parts will not be pulled from that outside operation and they will stop production. They will not overproduce. And that's a way to control your, 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 your working process inventory within your factory. Uh, and, and, and believe it or not, that ties into the concept of maybe a little bit beyond what we're talking about here. It ties into the concept of Jadoka. Because if you think about overproduction, that's a defect, okay? And Jadoka means, you know, the machine detects a defect and stops. Well, in a way, the, the Jadoka philosophy is just that too. I thank Clem Confessori for that concept, okay? Uh, you know, it, it really is a control mechanism where that outside operation doesn't continue to produce if this, is, this cell is not pulling production from them, okay? All right, a lot more to this than what I'm showing here, but I just wanna give you the idea of how one way we would use standard working process. Another way, of course, would be, I've got a CNC machine uh, and I, uh, I, I, I unload the part, I load the part, hit the green button, it processes, I walk away. I don't stand there and watch the machine run. No different than I won't stand there and watch my dryer run when I dry my clothes. Although sometimes that's fun, by the way, but uh, <laughs> you wouldn't do that, right? You go out and do something else. Well, we don't want the operator standing at the machine. You're gonna extend your lead times like crazy, right? You want that operator to move on. Well, that one piece of inventory inside that machine as the operator leaves is another, another uh, example of, uh, of standard working process, okay? All right. And there's a lot of different variations of this. Like if you had a, 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 an oven in your cell, whether it's a first in first out oven, whether it's a batch oven, there's all kinds of other nuances to this, but I really just want to introduce a basic concept here. And that's all I want to do here, okay? Okay, uh, some of the guidelines I kind of learned over the years and, and came up with, you know, you got to keep it visual, right? This is our standard work symbol down below that we use on all our documentations. You'll see that in a minute. We use it to detect abnormalities. You don't want to drain your line or bleed your line, okay? You don't want to take all the inventory out of your line because now you got to take the time to build it back up again, right? So you, when at the end of the shift, you want to leave the standard working process in the equipment, okay? Or at the assembly bench or wherever it may be. You don't want to just clean the line out because then you got to start from fresh the next day. And, and if you do a model changeover, as you're finishing model A, B should follow it so that you're not bleeding all A's out and then having to load B's into the line, okay? So, so, so keep that in, in, in mind that you always wanna maintain that standard whip. 
Uh, you want to assure that you're flowing, okay? Uh, standard whip does uh, main, assure the flow of the operator, all right, so that they are not standing there waiting for something to be produced. And then work in process build, of course, uh, people say, well, let's just build up a, you know, I know the TOC guys argue with me on this all the time, that we're going to have buffer stock. Well, you know, why? Because we have inconsistent cycle times on our equipment. Well, I don't really care if you have inconsistent cycle times on your equipment, so long as your equipment is meets tack time. And it doesn't make sense that if I have a tack time, let's say of 200 seconds, and my longest operation is 180 for machine cycle time, I'm not gonna do Kaizen on that 180 just because it's deemed the bottleneck. And it's one of my biggest problems with theory of constraints is that they never address tack time, even though they say they do, uh, they don't. And, and, and what they do is they say, well, you know, we got to work on that 180. Oh, no, I don't because I'm meeting tack time. Now, if I look out and I say, hey, my volume is going to go up and my new tack time is going to be 150. Yeah, now I've got a problem on the 180 and I've got to do Kaizen, machine Kaizen or what have you to get that time down. But to spend engineering resource, resources on a piece of equipment just because it happens to be the bottleneck or what the TOC guys call a Herbie, when it meets already, it already meets tack time is wasted engineering effort. Okay, so uh, the real game is if you get the demand, then address it, right? And, and make sure you know about that. And there's more, more to that math too with a, a good sales and operations planning process, you'll have that visibility. But don't go knocking down your bottlenecks if they're meeting tack time. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. Okay, uh, let's get into the third part, the cycle times, okay? I've got three cycle times I'm gonna introduce to you, all right? The operator cycle time, which I've referred to quite a bit already, okay? Uh, the machine cycle time and the processing cycle time, okay? So, you know, these are the definitions. Uh, the one thing I will say, no matter what you're talking about here, no matter what cycle time you're talking about, operator, machine, or processing, do not confuse it with tech time. Remember, tech time is the rate of demand that you have to hit. And, and by the way, I forgot to say this earlier, Tack time doesn't care that your operators didn't show up. They don't care that your machine broke down. They don't care that your supplier went on strike. Tack time doesn't care about your problems. How's that grab you? Okay. It's your tack time. And if you can't hit it, somebody else will, uh, namely your competition. Okay. It doesn't care about your problems. All right. So, so everybody says to me, well, you know, we got these issues. So how we, how do we calculate tack time? I, well, Take your available time divided by demand. Your demand is the demand. And, and, and luckily it's still your demand. And if you're not gonna supply that demand, it may go down <laughs> because you're gonna lose business, right? It doesn't care about your problems. It's agnostic in that regard, okay? So, so keep that in mind, all right? So let's get into this, operator cycle time, okay? Again, I kind of talked about this earlier, but it is the, through your time observation studies, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, uh, it takes operator number one, 60 seconds to form operations one, two, 10, and 11. And then we turn back to step one. Now, now when, you, when you think about that, um, it includes walking time, okay? The op and that's why one of the reasons for U-shaped cell is to minimize walking time, because walking time is a waste as a matter of fact, on the uh, standard work combination sheet, we actually call out waiting time, uh, walking time separately because it is that big of a waste, right? There's no value add with walking, okay? Uh, unless you're, you're, you you want to you know prove your health. <laughs> but other than that, no value add to walking. So I'm only picking on operator one here, but his cycle time is 60 seconds, okay? And that's all done through time observation. Now, if my tack time happens to be 50, I've got a problem, right? Uh, if my tack times, let's say 65, I'm in good shape because I'm gonna be able to meet tack time, okay? So uh, it is that amount of time that you look at here, okay? Now, um, one of the things to keep in mind here, and, and I wanna bring this up now, then later, a lot of companies I go into you walk in and the first time you do standard work, you walk into an operation and you've got Mary on, 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 the, on the press because she's the press person, 
You got Sam over on the testing equipment. He's the tester. You've got Billy, who is the assembler. And they're all at a station, okay? Uh, let's just take those th three examples. You got, what did I say? You have a press, assembly, and test. Well, the chances of each one of those stations being exactly in conformance with your tack time, which we know is ever changing because tack time, you know, uh, well, you know, you, you set your tack time based on a, on, a, on a planning horizon and it's different for every company, a week, a month, whatever, because there's seasonality, there's all kinds of different deviations in demand. But anyway, the chances of whatever tack time you happen to calculate and those operations meet that tack time never happens, okay? So what happens if your tack time is 100 seconds and Mary's at 30, and Billy's at 120, and Charlie, or the other guy's name is, is at you know 80. Well, guess what? That's a problem, right? So, so what you have to think about is divorcing the operator from the equipment, or from the machine, if you will, or from the process. Billy can't be the, the assembler, and Mary can't be the press person. Mary now, because she only has a you know a 30 second uh, uh, cycle time has to do 70 more seconds to meet 100 seconds, which means she has to move into the assembly process, okay? And this is where you have to look at multi-skilled operators. So you can't have people married to a station. It drives me nuts when I hear people say, oh yeah, we're setting up stations in our cell. Well, station to me means stationary. And I don't want the operator to be stationary. I want to think about the whole cycle time of that part as one contiguous set of, of dots and those dots represent seconds. And if my tack time is hundred, the first operator, I'm gonna do my best to cut the operation off at hundred seconds, okay? And then the next hundred seconds, I'm gonna give to the next operator and so forth and so on. And I don't care that Mary now is doing press work and assembly, okay? But she may care. And this is why we have to really work with the operators to, to put, you know, uh, skill-based compensation systems and would say, you know, we're going to, we're going to pay you now for knowledge. And I've done this with the UAW at Jake break when I negotiated the contract and people still don't believe me that, that we actually convinced the UAW that skill blocks were priority over seniority when it came to bumping somebody. Okay. Uh, and nobody believes me that I don't know if they still have that now. They probably engineered it out, but we actually, uh, you know, so if I had 20 years of experience in two skill blocks and you had five years with seven skill blocks, you had seniority over me, okay? Because we wanted to make it clear that we're going to reward knowledge, not tenure, okay? If I've got a guy that's uh, been at one operation for 20 years, he's not as valuable to me as somebody who's uh, who knows several operations that I can be a lot more flexible with, right? So you've got to think about that in terms of how you compensate your people too, and, and, and by the way, don't go to piece rate. Piece rate will be a killer for you and your quality will go down to tubes. Do not do piece rate in a lean environment, okay? That's uh, not what we want. We want people to work to tack time. We want them to work with a normal work pace, not to go crazy. We wanna help them identify problems so that we can eliminate and make their job easier. Again, that's what the ME should do. Um, so think about these seconds to build that part is one contiguous set of seconds. And I wanna do my best to find a good breakoff point to give each operator the amount of uh, uh, work in, uh, in, in concert with tack time, okay? Very important. So that's cycle time. And by the way, what would cycle time entail? I talked about walking, uh, which we know is not value added. Assembly, loading, unloading, gauging, testing, uh, go through the math on that. All these repetitive operations would be, uh, you know, populating a PC board, uh, loading a part into a wave solder. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the different things that you might be able to do. All those manual operations are what, are what you're looking at. Now, don't get confused with machines at this point. All you're concerned with when you look at cycle time of the operator is the operator itself and, and only the operator who may be either loading or unloading a piece of equipment. I don't care about the equipment right now. I'm gonna think about that later, okay? Right now, my focus is on the operator, all right? All right, so that's operator cycle time. Um, 
machine cycle time. Well, I like to think about it very easily. I hit the green button, the machine cycles, and it stops. That's the amount of time it takes to run the operation. So in this case, I've got, what is that, a drill? Um, looks like a piece of aluminum. So when I hit, this, I hit the green button, and the machine goes and it cycles, you know, it may have tool change, it might have uh, a number of different operations that it's doing, and then it comes to a rest. That's what I define as the cycle time of the machine. The only, it has, by the way, except for the fact that the, the operator pushed the cycle start button, has nothing to do with the operator, okay? Has nothing to do with the operator. It's just purely the machine cycle, okay? And by the way, when you start looking at, hey, you know, my machine cycle is greater than tack time. Yeah, okay, well, let's go look at speeds and feeds, okay? Why are we changing, Mr. Engineer, the tool two feet above the part? Oh, because we don't want to crash the machine. Oh, you got that kind of variability in this machine? You better get a new machine. It's a CNC machine. It's going to change it at exactly the same point every time. So why can't we bring the tool chains down, let's say, six, six inches or so? I'll give you a little bit of, of safety slack. But don't make the don't make the tool cut air, okay? And then about the the the, the speed as well. Don't bring it down in slow motion, but also you got to be you know you got to think about the the speed of the drill, and and the, and the feet of the drill uh, that you don't compromise the part quality either, right? Or or create excessive tool wear that doesn't make sense. But as long as you're within tack time, you could do machine kaizen and take time out of the machine to bring yourself back. The first knee jerk reaction is, oh, need a new piece of equipment. Right? No, let's go look at the equipment. Right? So, so that's one thing to think about as you as you go through this. Okay, but the machine cycle time is only the cycle time of the machine. That's it, and nothing else. Right? Uh, now let's talk about processing cycle time. The operator has to unload the equipment. Then the operator has to load the part. Then the machine cycles, which is what we just talked about, right? The cycle time of the machine, okay? Those three things together, plus a little footnote here about tool amortization time when you change out your tooling, which is not set up by the way, and I'll talk about it in a minute, okay? That's your processing time. So that, I've got to look at that. Now, why do I have to include the load and unload time? Because the machine's not working then. So I've got to include the load and unload along with the machine cycle time to, um, to, to understand whether or not that total time is with intact time, okay? So again, cycle time of the process has to be within your tack time. Otherwise, you're not gonna make the product that you need, all right? Here's another way to think about it. And I thank Colleen uh, uh, for this. Uh, she, she said, Mark, you gotta put this in a more visual format and uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Colleen uh, Sopulsa uh, out of uh, LH, uh, L3 uh, Harris. Um, and I did, she made me do this. She also caught me in a mistake when I did this. She said, hey, Mark, you did this wrong. And so, <laughs> but if you look at the cycle time of the process, um, there are really a couple things here, right? Well, first of all, it includes the cycle time of the machine, which is that shaded bar, that light one there. I've got my amortized tool cutter change. Again, not setup time, just when you're changing out a tool. And then I've got the load on load time, which comes out of the analysis we do on cycle time, uh, cycle time of the operator. So that cycle time of the operator could include assembly, it could include gauging, it could include uh, all kinds of other things, right? But there, if there is a load and unload manual element to that operator cycle time, it's gotta be included in the cycle time of the, uh, of the process, okay? Hope that's clear. Um, it gets a little bit confusing once in a while, but I think this, for the visual learners, uh, I hopefully this, this, uh, this graph or this chart will help you think that through. And I thank you, Colleen, Colleen for uh, forcing me into this and also for catching my mistakes. It's the first one I've made all year, believe it or not. It's hard to believe, I know. But uh, so uh, anyway, uh, uh, that's that's how we think about cycle time of the uh, of the process. Okay. By the way, I use unload unload and load time, but there could be other things that have to happen 
when you when the machine is down, like you may have to blow off chips. Uh, you might have to, which by the way, you should not have to do, but you might have to do it the way it's set up. Uh, you may have to do a gauge operation, okay, before you process the next part. Uh, you may want to take a chance and not do the gauge and do it after the cycle, but uh, that's a little bit against the philosophy. But if you if you're doing gold or something really expensive, you might want to do it then, you know, to make sure you're not making a mistake. Uh, so anyway, I'm only using load and unload time as uh, as examples, but there could be other types of things you do that prohibits you from cycling the machine. Okay, so so to keep that in mind as you, as, as you go through. These are the five key documents of, uh, of uh, standard work, okay? Um, and I'm gonna take you through each one of these, all right? It's your time observation sheet. That's where I look at the operator cycle time. It's the, process, it's the uh, processing capacity analysis. That's where I look at the equipment, okay? And that cycle time of the process I just talked about, that's what that is. It's then you take both of those documents and they feed into what we call the standard work combination sheet, where we're looking at now the operator and the machine and how they play with each other. And again, you can see that red line in there. It's tack time, isn't it? And then uh, I got my standard worksheet, which talks about the layout of the cell and the flow of the operator. And then I've got my, uh, my operator front loading chart or what we learned in Japan called the Yamazumi chart. Okay, if you like the Japanese words. Uh, and, 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 and that basically takes all your operators and, and, and compares them against your tack time. Okay, so I will go through each one of these uh, documents now to hopefully, you know, have you understand what this is all about. Now, now time observation, unlike a machine cycle, I've got to take several, several time studies uh, or, or cycles because there's variability with human beings, right? Uh, they're not gonna do it exactly the same all the time. So we were taught seven to 10, you know, on, on a cycle. Now, if you have a process that's four hours long, okay, and you're doing two a day, it might be really hard to get seven observations. You probably wanna do that over time, but you may not be able to do that like right away. But anyway, uh, or you may wanna do parts of it, but, but, what we're looking at here is, and this is just a very simple example that we use in our, in our training, where we get up from a chair, we walk to the board, we pick up the pen, we write on the board, we put down pen, walk to chair, sit down. So the first thing you got to do is sit with the operator and say, hey, I need you to do the job one part at a time, which sometimes is a big deal. And I need you to tell me how you do it. Give me the, give me the process steps. And then I'd like you to hold to those process steps. You've got to involve the operator. Now, if you guys go down to the cell with a stopwatch and start taking times without talking to the operator and bringing them into this process, big problem, okay? You've got to incorporate this with the operator. Matter of fact, uh, oh no, and I've got a slide on this somewhere in here that says he thinks the standards should come from the operator. They, they should be involved in creating uh, these, these standards. Okay. So, uh, so keep about that. Think about that. So first thing you do is you say to yourself, okay, well, tell me the cutoff points. Like what are the logical things that you're, you're seeing? Well, well, you saw me get up from the chair. Then the next step, oh, you saw me walk to the board. Oh, then you saw me pick up pen. Then you saw me write, then you put it down, then walk back and sit down. So what are the cutoff points on each one of these? Right. I get up from chair, maybe that cycle doesn't end until you start seeing my foot move to walk to the board. And maybe walk to the board doesn't end until I my hand touches the pen. And, and maybe right on board doesn't start until the pen actually hits the board. And maybe put down pen doesn't happen until I stop writing. All these things are called observation points. So when you guys are looking at your operations, you've got to note what the observation cutoff points are so you could take these elemental times. Now, we're not taking these times by themselves. Like for example, I'm not going to time seven iterations of you getting up from the chair. No, I need to take, and this is a very important point. I need to take the flow of the entire cycle in, to, in its context together, okay? I can't cherry pick this and just, and that's one of the difference between old IE work 
where they would look at one operation, this time one operation, but they won't look at the flow of those operations. That's why I say earlier, this is not traditional IE studies, okay? Although they're very, David Thompson might argue with me and, and say, well, you know, there are a lot of IE concepts that are baked into this and he'd be absolutely right, okay? But you don't look at just one operation, okay? You look at the whole thing. So as I go through this, I got my stopwatch started, okay? And I'm in black, I'm just recording the time that's on a stopwatch. And usually we do this with two people, right? Uh, one people's calling out the times of a person's recording. But you got to know the time observation points, okay? So you go through this and you do seven iterations, okay? And then later you go back and do the math and in red, we subtracted all the times to get the elemental time. Now, when you look at this, the lowest time I had was 26 seconds. I had 29, 33, 28, and so forth. Oh, we should average those. No, you never saw an average, okay? 26 was the lowest that, but you gotta make sure that, you know, the operator didn't excessively work faster. Sometimes they, it's, people are funny when they when they get timed, they, they either go faster or slower or, you know, you tell them you want a normal pace, okay? And they didn't have any issues, which you don't wanna record abnormalities in this anyway. But it was the best time without the operator breaking their back, uh, using the judgment that, that they can sustain it, you know, for the for the whole day, okay. But for some reason, we're able to do this in 26 seconds, and that's the standard I want to put down, okay. Now, if I go through and take each element lowest time and add them up on the right, it comes out to 25 seconds. Well, I can't use 25 seconds, so I can't cherry pick the best of the best out of this math. I've got to look at it in context of the cycle, okay? So cycle number one happened to be the quickest one uh, without any abnormalities. I didn't skip a step or work extra fast or anything like that, right? So what do I do with that one second? Well, now I use my subjectivity and I add that back to get me to 26 because I do want to use the lowest elemental time in my standard work combination sheet when I bring this over, but I have that one second to deal with, okay? I subjectively said, you know what? Uh, I see sixes and sevens and eights, and it's the longest one. I'm going to add that back to that cycle. There's no real science behind that one, okay? And at the end of the day, it probably doesn't matter because you probably got a little bit of error in your times between cutoff points anyway. But but you put that in there, and now I've got I've got a 26 second of which two, five, two, seven, three, five, and two, respectively, for those seven operations. Those are the times I'm going to go with on my combination sheet. Okay. All right. So, and, and by the way, time observation is done per operator. Okay. Not, not, uh, not, uh, uh, you know, for the whole cell, you do it per operator. So one sheet per operator. Now keep in mind that we don't want what we call a rabbit run where one operator goes through the whole cell and makes everything. And then the operator follows that person. We don't want rabbit runs. Not good. Okay. For a lot of different reasons. Uh, and, and what have you. And again, we got to think about the fact that sooner or later, we're going to probably have to think about combining operations so that we are flowing uh, in a one piece flow fashion. Okay. Again, Mary can't be the assembler and Joe can't be the tester. Uh, you know, Mary may have to test and assemble. Okay. Uh, as we go through. All right. So that's the, the time observation form. Okay. Again, I talked about this earlier. You must separate the operator from the machine. So people get confused. They say, oh, well, the operator is working into the machine, so I have to count that cycle time too. No, you don't. All you have to do is put the spotlight on the operator when you're taking time observations for the operator, okay? That's all you got to worry about. Almost pretend the machine's not there and say, well, yeah, the operator loads and unloads. Okay, got that. And that's all I care about right now. I don't care how long it takes to cycle the equipment or the equipment takes to cycle There'll be time for that, which we're going to talk about next. But right now, I don't want to confuse the issue with the equipment. Okay, I only want to focus on uh, on the operator. Okay. Who's willing to do this? Ono says standards should not be forced down from above, but rather set by the production workers themselves. Who has the courage to do that? Even in a union environment, hey, take the stopwatch, time your own guys, and then let them time you. 
now it's your times that you're doing. We're not forcing this on you. I'm not coming in with some arbitrary demand that says that 30 second operation, you got to do it in 15. Otherwise you're gonna find somebody else, right? By the way, <laughs> I've seen that happen, which is not a good thing uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but the, you know, if you, uh, if you get the operators involved in the standard work event in the Kaizen itself, in the actual, you know, setting of these standards, you can have a lot easier time with them. And obviously, you know, you guys got to let us know, uh, Charlie, when you can't make the standard. Uh, and, 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 if, and if you don't make rate, let's say, uh, you only make 80 when you should have made a hundred. If you walk into that cell and say, Charlie, what the heck's wrong with you guys? Why didn't you make, you know, instead the conversation should probably go something like this. Hey, Charlie, we didn't make rate today. Tell me what's going, what can we do with the process to help us think through how to make that rate? What problems did you have today? Let's work together on that, try to solve it. All of a sudden you took the spotlight off of Charlie. You're asking him for his help or Mary or whoever's in, you know, the, the cell itself. There could be five people in the cell, okay? And you're not going in and, and penalizing the operator. You know, productivity, everybody wants to measure productivity. And the whole notion most people have is it's all about making the operator work and making sure they're doing their job. Well, for the, the main reason why you don't, you, don't, uh, you don't make your productivity numbers is not because of the operator, it's because of the process. And, 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 and that could be a quality problem. You could have all kinds of quality issues machine downtime, which is a quality issue too, right? If the machine goes down, you could have supplier issues, you know, all kinds of issues, right? And so if you look at the real reasons why you can't hit your productivity number, that's why safety, quality, delivery, and cost, cost is last because all those other things drive cost, which, you know, productivity is one aspect of cost. But most of the time, companies focus on cost alone and instead of a safety, quality, delivery, and cost mindset, they have a cost, 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 cost mindset. Even though they'll talk a game and they'll put up the poster boards on SQDC, but they won't behave that way. All they'll do is do a bunch of PowerPoints and reports and printouts that only talk about cost and they won't talk about quality. Quality is the, probably the biggest driver of, of, of cost and it gets ignored all the time. So that's why I sometimes look at productivity numbers and say, really? I mean, you really think that this is an operator issue? Really? I don't know. Sometimes it might be, but most of the time, and if you go back to what Deming said, and Steve Feltovich talks about this all the time on his LinkedIn post, and so does uh, John Foster out of the UK. You go back, uh, all you guys do that I mentioned, you know, you go, you go back and you say to yourself, it's not the operator, it's a process. And we can beat on the operator all we want, but we're not going to fix those problems if, in that regard. So, so, so think about that. And that's, this is one of the things Ono's trying to do is get buy-in with the operator so that the work, you're working together to solve these problems. And also, again, it's a respect for people issue. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, uh, pa Patrick Ross out of Australia. It's a respect for people issue when you allow problems to persist. And standard work is the one best way that I've known of to be able to attack and identify those problems so we can get rid of them, right? All right, enough about that. Process capacity is the second document. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the machine cycle time uh, and I'm looking at the load on load, that manual part there is a load on load, let's say. Okay, and then I'm amortizing tool change time. So if I have a piece of equipment that has a tool, uh, uh, when I say tool, I'm not talking about fixture, I'm not talking about changeover, I'm talking about a cutter, let's say, okay? Uh, a cutter that, you know, every 100 pieces I need to change it out. It takes 120 seconds. So I do have to add 1.2 seconds back to the tool change time, okay? Uh, so this is my time to complete is 70.2 seconds for the mill. And when I divide that into available time, I come up with 385 pieces. My tack time is based on 350, all set. Down here, I've got a problem. When I do the math down here on grinding, it's 303 pieces per day and I need 350, I've got a problem. Okay, so this is a way you could tell whether or not you're gonna have capacity problems. If all of these are under your tack time or in this case, you know, under the way this works out, if all of these are under your, your required demand of 350, which is what you use to calculate your tack time, 
then you're all set, right? But you can also use this document to model your factory to say, hey, look, uh, our vibe's going up 20%. Let's recast this whole this whole sheet to see what our future is going to look like six months from now. I may have equipment problems, or maybe I start doing equipment Kaizen, okay? Or thinking about something different in terms of how you, you know, the last thing you want to do is go out and say, we need more capital. First thing you want to say, okay? Uh, that's, a, that's a problem. You don't want to do that. I mean, you may have to do that, uh, but but at the end of the day, you uh, you don't want to revert to that as, as your first uh, 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 choice, right? So that's the machine, I'm sorry, that's the process capacity analysis that we do, okay? So now we're having a separate look at the equipment, all right? We already looked at the operator. Now we're looking at the equipment. Now the next thing we do is we combine it. And this is why it's called a combination sheet. So you can see tack times drawn in here in red. Okay. Uh, I've got all of the different operator sequences. And by the way, this is per operator. So every operator will have a standard work combination sheet. Uh, you can see pick up raw material, load on load, gauge part, uh, assemble bracket, you know, the whole thing, right? And the dark black bars are the, uh, uh, the manual time. The little squiggly lines, oh, sorry. The little squiggly lines going from bar to bar are the uh, walk time. And then the dotted line is the machine time. Okay, so once the operator cycles the machine. Now, you'll notice on that step six on the, on the, on the grinding, once it hits tack time, it, it wraps back around. As long as that bar, which is sitting under, I can't read it, but let's say 12, 13 seconds, okay, doesn't violate the manual time. That's another visual that says, hey, I've got capacity, I'm okay, okay? So uh, for that piece of equipment. So this combination sheet is a uh, document by operator that uh, we put together to combine the interface between the operator and the equipment, okay? Um, so that's the combination sheet, the third document. Uh, and then standard worksheet, you've got, um, you've got your, 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 your flow of the operator. I laid out the cell. Here's my steps, go from one to two to three, all the way to seven and back to one. Notice on this, there's a lot of walk time here, right? This operator got to walk from assembly, step seven, all the way back to one. A lot of waste. And that's what these things call out, right? So this is a visual that should be placed at the, at the workstation as well, okay? And uh, interestingly enough, this is what happened to me one time when I first learned this and I was running the operations at Jake Brake and Nikau came in and I said, hey, uh, Nikau son, we need to work on SMED, single minute exchange of die and TPM. He refused. Delusio son, no, we need to work on standard work. But Nikau son, I already know standard work. I can do operator loading charts, combination sheets, process capacity sheets, did you know that I can even take time observations by myself without a partner? That's how good I am, right? Delusio son, come with me. He took me over to one of my cells. How many operators are on your standard worksheet? Uh, I said uh, five operators. How many operators are in the cell? I said, uh, there's eight. But you must understand it, Kyle. What? He cut me off. He said, no, I don't want to hear your pathetic excuses. You do not know standard work, is what he said to me. And the Japanese had a very interesting perspective. They couldn't understand why Americans would say they understood something when they couldn't do it, okay? And that was me, right? I couldn't do it. By the way, I might confuse you here, but if you go back, if you go back to this chart, I like to do these, I like to do these, uh, these, these uh, standard worksheets in a number of different ways, two different ways. One by operator. So this would be for this one operator, okay? And I'd have another one for the next operator or whatever. But then I would like to have one sheet at the mouth of the cell that shows everybody on the same type of sheet, okay? So this is clear instructions as to who's responsible for what operation, all right? So I just wanna make sure that's clear. But anyway, he was looking at the one that had everything on there. And, and, and again, I had five on my standard work but I was running the cell with eight. Delizio son, you do not know standard work. So guess what we spent time doing that week? We didn't work on SMED and we didn't work on TPM. We worked on 
the standard word, okay? Last but not least, the Yama, Yama, Yamazumi chart or the, uh, the, the, the operator loading charts, okay? Uh, here's a before and after where when I go in and take my initial times of all my different operators, here's what their total cycle time looks like. Now you look at this and you say, well, a couple operators are okay, but, but I've got two operators that are grossly over attack time of 60. Uh, that's a problem. And I've got uh, some that are significantly below attack time. Okay. So what do I do? Well, I get into these arguments all the time on, 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 on LinkedIn. People say we should balance the cell. And I'll show you that in a minute. No, we don't balance the cell, the operators to tack time. We front load the operators. And I'll talk about that again in a second. But once I redistribute the labor and you know redistribute the labor and front load the labor, you could see that I only now need nine operators because all that, on that first chart, the difference between the tack time and the bars are all dead time. It's all wait time, okay? So I don't want anybody to wait. I want them fully loaded to tack time. So you can see down below that I've loaded the best I could because sometimes you've got breakoff points where you can't split an operation up. So somebody might be way, way a little bit under because you can't give them any more work in that regard, okay? And that's, that's basically what you see with operator number six down below. Uh, or in one and two, okay. But anyway, uh, the whole point is I went from 11 to nine just by loading. I didn't do any Kaizen yet, okay. All I did was load the cell, uh, front load it, and got rid of all the wait time. Didn't do any Kaizen at all, all right. So that's the Yamazumi chart. Now, what happens is when you take your initial times, you're going to look something like this, okay. And then the people that want to balance, this is what balance is. Well, guess what? If I'm balanced everybody at 50 seconds and my tech time 60, I'm overproducing. I'm producing too fast. I don't want to balance my operators. Balance means everybody's equal. And no, no, I don't want to do that. I want to front load where I bring everybody up. All that wait time that you see in the second chart where it says balanced gets driven to that last operator, okay? Now you say to yourself, well, well, wait a minute. No, that's not fair. Everybody else got to do all that work and, and the operator at the end can stand around until he gets the next part from D. Yeah, that's true. But that's why you rotate people, right? And you want to rotate people because you want to be able to learn different skills. Okay, now we had a plant down in Tennessee where we would, uh, we would rotate on a daily basis. But what happened every Thursday, the absenteeism was higher for the person on a brazing station, which is a real ugly operation. And that person will always call in sick. The absenteeism on that one, one operation was really high. So what we did is we said, okay, well, we're gonna rotate every two hours instead of every day. It did not necessarily address the issue why that was such an ugly operation. Uh, uh, so, you know, we, we put that on the list that said, okay, look, we gotta, we gotta Kaizen this operation. So operators don't think it's so distasteful and they don't want to do it, right? Again, the whole notion, make the job easy for the operator. That's where the manufacturing engineers should be only focused on, right? Uh, most I've met do not think that way, okay? And then after Kaizen, once I continue to take cycle time out through Kaizen on A, B, C, D, and E, I continue to front load and sooner or later, E goes away, okay? And I don't need it anymore. So I'm really only running this cell with four people with the same demand, with the same tech time. Okay. So what happens to E? We lay them off, right? Is that what we do? We just send them off the door and then ask A, B, C, and D for their ideas, how they can continue to improve. Is that what we do? No, we don't do that. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Thank you, Davey Thompson, on this one. Uh, this from Scotland. Uh, well, I said Scotland. He actually lives in England, but he's Scottish. So I'm going to put down Scotland. Uh, 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 he, he, this, he, he contributed this, uh, this is a standard operating procedure. Okay. This is outside of standard. It's not outside of standard work. It's consistent with standard work, but the standard work combination sheet has the, has the, the steps involved, but it doesn't have the granularity that a standard operating procedure does. And this goes back to training within industries. Okay. So if I had a, a, an operation that said, you know, uh, 
uh, assemble front frame on my standard work combination sheet. Well, this is the detail behind how you do that. And I will tell you right now that pictures are, are they say well, pictures are worth a thousand words. Yeah, uh, pictures are better than, 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 uh, than text, okay? But these should be posted at the machine as well. And these are as important as standard work combination sheet. And standard work combination sheet isn't enough to give an operator the granularity as to how to do the job. So standard operating procedures are an integral part of this. I should probably include them as one of the documents of standard work, but I kind of kept it separate in this case. But needless to say, you need to have standard operating procedures to back up your standard work, okay? Very important. And again, thank you, Davey from, I'm gonna still say you're from Scotland, uh, but uh, thanks, Davey. And by the way, that was his form that he developed uh, for uh, either one of his clients or one of his companies they work for. But it's a good, it's a good, it's a good uh, form. And again, he's got the quality checks on there. Oh, I didn't go through that with the standard worksheet, but you'll see the quality and safety checks on there, just like he has on here. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, People say, oh, lean, yeah, less employees are needed. That, that was the black eye that lean got over the years. And you want to know something? Well-deserved because many CEOs, I will not work with a CEO who says, I cannot guarantee no layoffs to my workforce because of lean improvements. I will just not work with a company that wants to do that, okay? Uh, if you start a lean transformation and you don't have this no layoff policy, and by the way, you may have to do something if the, if the economy shifts or whatever. Okay, well, that's another conversation for another day. But, uh, but and even then I can make an argument that you, should have, you shouldn't do that, but uh, it's not my money, okay? It's your money. But if you can't have a no layoff policy and be explicit about it and over communicate it, okay? Do not attempt a lean transformation. I kind of thought about this. I said, you know, that's a train wreck. So I had to find a picture of a train wreck down below. By the way, go on the internet and look for train wrecks. There are so many, I didn't believe how many train wrecks are in this world. There's a million pictures of train wrecks on the internet. I thought that was a safe way to travel. Um, but anyway, you can add train wreck to your resume if you do not do that, okay? If you don't have a no, if you lay somebody off because of a lean improvement, you know, you go from uh, 11 to nine and those two people leave, how are you gonna make further improvements? to get employee involvement. As a matter of fact, employees will work against you and find ways to, to fabricate overtime, find ways to, to fabricate problems or not tell you that a machine doesn't sound right today. Yeah, I'm gonna let it go. It'll break down, I'll get Saturday overtime, right? That's a problem. Okay, so, so, so you may or may not have control of that policy, but it's something that you really gotta think about Okay, now over to the left, and I won't read them all to you, but those are some strategies that you can think about when you when you uh, do have excess labor, because you will. If you do standard work the right way and do Kaizen appropriately, you will create excess labor, okay? Which by the way is a good thing, but you've got to think about what you do with that excess labor. So here's some suggestions on the left. Uh, ideally, you want to grow the business. So you can redeploy people into, you know, if your tack time goes from 200 to, to, to 150, do the math, everything else being equal, you need more people. Great, I can redeploy that person into that cell, into that cell because it has extra demand. So this is where sales got to get on board and start growing the business. And by the way, when you take down lead times, and improve productivity, take down lead times, improve your on-time delivery and your quality through standard work, it is a vehicle for growth. And if your sales guys know how to use that as a competitive advantage, uh, we've done this in a, in, a, in a temperature control business in Brighton, England, a commodity. And we tripled the business by taking the lead time down from 28 days to three. And, and, and by the way, when we did that, we took inventory returns from two to 18. On time to delivery to request date in the high 90s. So uh, the managing director at the time, God rest his soul, he's not with us anymore, but he, he didn't think we can go to three days. And we told him, yeah, you can. And it took us about nine months to get there. We cellularized, we did all the things we're talking about here. And we got him down a three day lead time and distributors said, you know what? I don't have to carry the inventory anymore. My Gimbari looks great. I'm going to order from you. Our volume tripled. Matter of fact, more than tripled because we were the best supplier and it was a commodity product. I think he might've even got some price out of it too. Okay. So 
think about how all that works, right? This all ties together into growing the business and growth is a good thing for, for everybody, right? So, but again, if you're going to lay somebody off because of a lean improvement, good luck, okay? That's what I'll tell you, it's good luck. Here's an example of where I came from. Uh, uh, we were a URW, it still is a URW shop. Uh, uh, Jake Brake and it's a 10 year performance history. You can see that we went from 65 million to 220 million with essentially the same headcount in a URW shop. Okay. Our productivity, three kits per 100 man hours to 35. Okay. I, I, I won't read all the math to you here, but our, our revenue increased, you know, 238%. Headcount only went up a marginally, you know, four and a half percent, all with a UAW shop. So I never want to hear, oh, we can't do it because we have a union. If, if you can't do it because you have a union, I will turn around and say, you can't do it because of you, not the union, okay? So uh, anyway, here's clear evidence that this can be done. And we had an OAF policy, by the way. George Konaseker and Art Byrne uh, uh, committed to the UAW that we would not lay them off because of lean improvements. And they, that's why one of the reasons they agreed to the, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, multi-skilled uh, pay, you know, we, we paid them based on skill blocks. Uh, when you became a multi-skilled operator, you had that kicker and that was seniority over, as I said earlier, over, uh, over tenure. Okay. So it can be done. Okay. And, uh, I don't want to hear that, you know, it's cultural and it can only work in Japan. Now this is Connecticut, uh, industrial belt, kind of old industrial belt, Connecticut, uh, old time workers there, great people at the melting pot. It was uh, the United Nation. We had every single nationality there in the world uh, and it worked, okay? These questions, um, I'm not gonna go through right now. I, I would like to maybe take the time to open up uh, some of your questions and then these will be on the, the presentation, okay? So that you can freeze the frame and just read them, okay? So I'm not gonna go through every one of these, okay? Um, and, and uh, but there's some, some, some key questions. But by the way, before I, I, I turn it over, some notable comments, John McKellen, uh, uh, who is the individual who, you know, three months standing in the same spot in Toyota, in, uh, in Lexus, in Japan. Uh, although there can be no Kaizen improvement without a standard, and we all understand that, and Ono said that, without a standard, there's no Kaizen, right? There's no improvement. How do you get standard work without a Kaizen? Good point. Use the process of Kaizen to build your standard work. Kaizen is the mechanism, standard work is the output. Thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Davy Thompson, my friend in England, who I call Scotland. Uh, to do standard work, you must confess to the following. We are doing the wrong things badly. We are doing the wrong things right, or we are doing the right things badly. Now, by the way, he has a, a white paper on LinkedIn, uh, if you connect with him, and you can download this white paper that he has. And that's where I got that from. Uh, very insightful. How many times have we tried to optimize a suboptimal si situation that we shouldn't be doing to begin with? Okay, happens all the time. So first, ask yourself: You know, are we really doing the right things? Right? Uh, Davy, Davy's really big on that. Uh, uh, Colleen uh, Sapelsa. Okay, staying true to the basic, back to the basics. TPS principle is not a choice of convenience. In fact, it's a very lonely club. And oh yeah, by the way, it is. It's a choice you've made to help people work more consistently, safely, and to the highest quality. So again, that has the notion of respect for people in it too, doesn't it? So you know, going back to basics is a, is, a, is a real big deal, and 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 those basics uh, um, uh, are missed by most people doing lean today. And this is one of the key basics: standard work. Uh, John Foster, my buddy in over the UK, who contributes an awful lot of good thought capital on LinkedIn. Standard work is, coup is coupled with testing work as it is being done. Interesting. The end results are that gaps between what is expected and what actually occurs becomes evident. If the work sequence varies each time, there's no baseline for evaluation. So, so think about that. If you don't standardize and you can't tell what your delta is to that one best way, uh, what John calls a standard, okay, how do you know what your problems are, right? Because everything's moving all the time, right? And oh yeah, by the way, when you go make a change in a Kaizen and you update your standard work, oh yeah, by the way, 
it changes for everybody, not just for one person, right? So, oh, but, and one of the things is, how often should standard work be updated? I had a rule of thumb and I got this from Nakao. He said once a month, because either your tack time is going to change, which means you're going to have different standard work or you're going to do Kaizen. If you're not doing Kaizen in a month, it's a bad thing. Okay, it's not a good thing. You got to start questioning yourself. Why is my standard work documentation have the same date on it for six months? Not a good thing. Uh, Patrick Ross, my friend in Australia. Uh, standard work is the practical expression of respect of the work of our people. And again, Pat's talking about, you know, uh, uh, respect for people, right? It, which is a unbelievable uh, insight that he had on that, which I think is really good. Uh, and then the last, uh, Steve Feltovich, he gave me a lot of great input. I only picked on one. Um, please don't confuse work and process inventory with standard work and process. Totally different, okay? Uh, standard work and process is what you say should be there to, 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 to assure flow in your operation. Anything outside of that, waste, okay? And that's why you've got to document on the documentation what your standard work is all about, okay? All right. Um, there's other things here. I got my bio in here. You can read that on LinkedIn. No big deal. Uh, uh, I've got an appendix here as to what to do with partial operators. I'm not going to spend the time on that right now, but that's in the appendix. Okay. Um, what do you do with the documentation? I, I should have added David Thompson standard operating procedures and I'll update that someday. But uh, again, that should be at the workstation. The standard operating procedures should be at the workstation, as Davey indicated, okay? Uh, and then um, uh, here's a, a general guidelines for conducting a standard work Kaizen. I'll go back to John McKellen, how he says, hey, standard work should be done in the context of a Kaizen, right? So here's a approach that I like to use uh, to do, stand I'm, not, I'm not gonna go through all the detail here. Uh, and then uh, uh, capital appropriations, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but this is how, when I was a CFO of Drake Break, I evaluated capital requests. I didn't just look at net present value and some bogus overhead savings that didn't make any sense. I looked at all these things, okay? Uh, these are the questions that I asked. It was interesting when Nakao, Nakao was a classic. I can write a book on him. Matter of fact, there was a book written, written on him. And uh, uh, an engineer came up to him and said, Nakao, we need a new machine. And Nakao said, well, why do you need a new machine? Uh, because this one is old. I used to drive them nuts about when you tell them the machine's old. I remember going to a connecting rod cell at Hino Motors in Japan. When one of my customers was owned by Toyota, the youngest piece of equipment was 10 years old. Okay. How old is it? Nakao said. The engineer said, it's 15 years old. Well, how old are you? Engineer said, I'm 32. Hmm. Then it looks like we need a new engineer too. All right. Okay. So he made his point. Okay. It used to drive nuts because everybody wants to buy the new bell and whistles and not really think through. And this is getting into 3P and the father moonshine and all that as to how he thinks about equipment, but that's a seminar for another day, okay? Uh, again, documentation for one more time here. And uh, uh, here's a Yamazumi chart that has more of a breakdown of, uh, you know, in this case, I've got assembly walk gate. So I actually, actually break down the elements by operator so I can see where the waste is, right? Um, and here's another one, okay. Uh, you, th in this case, we're looking value added, non-value added, okay. So it's another way to look at the same Yamazumi chart, all right. Uh, playbooks, you wanna be able to have an operator playbook where you have a five operator play, a four operator, play, you know, whatever is meaningful for your area so that when when your, your, your tech time changes or an operator shows in, up sick and you have another operator to play with, you don't want to batch. So you've got to have a coach's playbook. And uh, uh, just like a, a, a US football team would have uh, that you pull out the play that you need for that particular situation, okay? And uh, I'm gonna stop there and take questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Hey, Mark. Yes, and, and, and if probably everybody has the same issues as I do, can we take two minutes for a bio break and then uh, I'll be right back, how's that?
I'm sorry, I had to take the bio break. Uh, uh, I live in Arizona and, and it's so dry here, we have to drink a lot of water. So I think you guys probably know what that means. So, uh, okay, so uh, uh, we had some questions. I, and by the way, I know we're only scheduled for two hours, but I'd be willing to stay over if there's more questions. So uh, it's not a problem. Hey, Mark, I will probably break the ice here. Um, Hi. I, I, I was wondering about the about the instructions, basically yeah, the standard sequence and instructions. When you have to implement that in, a, um, let's say, uh, non-manufacturing um, procedure, like, I don't know, I'm thinking about logistics in particular, but transactional um, operations more in general, um, where would you start from? Would you start from standardizing? I don't know. The, I'm thinking about the forms, the um, that kind of that kind of things. Um, I don't know if I was clear. Uh, yeah, we didn't talk about transactional standard work, uh, but uh, but I, I, I will I will send you uh, method. I'm going to do another another um, webinar probably next month on lean accounting. Uh, which I started in 1989. I was kind of, I kicked that whole concept off. And one of the things I did do is standard work in accounts payable, for example. In that presentation, I should say, we did that in accounts payable. And I will show you the standard work uh, sheets that we used in accounts payable to drive that. So it really isn't no different uh, when you think about it, Andrea. It, it, it's, uh, uh, you're going to start basically with you know, do you have, first of all, do you have a repetitive process? Okay. And if it's a repetitive process in terms of either how you pay an invoice, how you take an order, how you do a, uh, an engineering change order, whatever it may be, if it's a repetitive process, the process is really no different than machining a part, for example, because what you'll, what you'll look at here is you'll say to yourself, okay, well, what's the first step? Okay. And then what's the second step? And you, 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 you lay that out on your, your time observation form. And then you do ask the person doing the job to do it the same way uh, so that you get that repeatability and, and you involve them on and how to do that you don't tell them how to do it you know and then um and then you say okay well um let's uh let's record this and, and take the time observations just like anything else right you need to come up with your demand which basically means you have to strike your tack time okay and then you do the math so so in the example i would show you in the lean accounting we were having four people doing payables and receivables. And when we got done, the payables, we had three people doing payables. We only needed 0.6 people to do it. Okay. And, um, but why did we have three? Because of unbelievable quality problems, missing purchase orders, unit or measure problems, all kinds of issues, right? So we were spending most of the time not paying invoices. We spent most of our time tracking down problems. So again, I talked about quality and productivity, right? Quality is the biggest driver of productivity, in my opinion, okay? And, and, and uh, whether it's product quality or process quality, uh, you can probably put under the umbrella quality a lot of things, but we were able to get down to one person doing receivables and payables, okay? Once we got done with the Kaizans and the problem solving. And, and that's one thing I didn't talk about, but you know, to me, lean, uh, the more I've been doing this, the more it's, it's all about problem solving. Right, it's really what it is, right? And and and, and knocking these problems down permanently, forever, and uh, and then those three people were actually redeployed into other positions. Okay, a matter of fact, one became a production planner, another one went to uh, engineering, and did something there with engineering change. I can't remember what the other one did, but anyway, it was several years ago. But but we didn't lay them off. Okay, they helped us really kaize in the process, so we didn't have to run with four people doing that kind of work. You know, so uh, anyway. I don't know if I answer your question now, but it's, it, the process is not all that much different. Yeah, so so you basically start tracking firefighting as if it were um, a quality problem, kind of a rework of your of your process, basically. Like every every, I mean, yeah. Yeah, well, we had a hospital bed, and then we isolated the problems, and then did a Pareto, to, and you'll see that in the presentation, uh, and, and then looked at where the biggest problems were, and we tacked each one on its own merit, you know. Uh, now, one of the things you're going to find that when you try to do flow in the transactional department, if you're using a computer to process the transaction, okay, 
those are usually batch operations. So we did something with Mass Mutual, for example, and and uh, and so what would happen was, you know, one one person would take a claim and pull up the claim screen and had to complete the whole claim. They couldn't hand it off to the next operator. Okay, we actually had IT set it up where we could break it off anywhere we wanted so that that claim could go to the next operator. Okay. And he had to break the paradigm that he had to stick with this claim all the way through. No, you didn't, you know? And, and uh, so we actually got a, a, a true flow as opposed to having five operators do five claims, each one do their own claim. We, we would have five operators if that's what the requirement was. I would do one fifth, the next guy would do one fifth and we flowed that thing through in a true one piece flow fashion. So in the admin, it's actually harder to do than than uh, than than the product, you know, because of the because of the way computer systems are designed. So does that make sense? I mean, you know, but uh, it does. It does. I look forward to your next webinar. Okay. Good. Good. Well, maybe we'll do it over in Italy. Well, <laughs> tell me if you do. Okay. I come in person. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Boy, I see some some familiar names on here. Jim Kenny and Cedric Brown. Wow. Um, I I have a question. Um, so say you've, you're in a company that's that's new to lean, um, and you're you're starting off with the basics. Would would standard work come after you've done like a value stream map or a process mapping of the whole company, or would you more so try and do it beforehand? Well, here's the first thing I'd have you think about, right? The first thing I have you think about is, is uh, uh, don't think about, oh, my objective is to implement lean. My objective is to achieve my, my stakeholder objectives, which include your employees, your customers, and your shareholders, right? Uh, so what are those objectives? Let's start there first, okay? Uh, and, and by the way, there are other stakeholders, but I just mentioned those three. Um, so let's start with the objectives in mind first, okay? And then from there, you know, you can't do everything at, at once, right? So you have to prioritize. And, and once I understand my objectives, you'll soon find out, and this is a mistake we made in the early days with DBS. You know, we all thought that DBS was the objective. We were, let's all get crazy about DBS. We became enamored with the Dan and her business system when we were doing some dumb things. So we said to ourselves, well, that's not the objective anymore. The objective really, this is where strategy deployment came into play. Okay, let's focus on these key things that we have to go after and think about the processes that are really gonna drive those. Once I understand the processes, okay, or the areas of the business that I wanna go after, I might say to myself, geez, you know what? I need to put a value stream map over there, okay? In that product line or in that value stream or whatever it may be. Uh, maybe I'll use that value stream there to understand the wastes, right? But just to go in and say, I'm just going to map everything and this do value stream as an exercise is useless because if you don't have an end game in mind as to what you're trying to achieve, and then and then once I do the value, if, if I do think that the value stream is the right tool, then what I'll say to myself is, okay, well, when I, I do my current state, then I'll interrogate my current state, okay, which means I ask it a bunch of questions. Where can I flow? Uh, where can I combine operations? Where can I take out inventory? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and we have a whole list of, the, of those questions, you know, um, and then I create my future state and, you know, how far do you go out? I don't know. I've been going out six, nine months or so. Keep it actionable. And, uh, and then, and then off of that conversion between your current and your future state, you have a value stream plan and that value stream plan lays out the things that you're going to have to do to get you to that future state. Right? So, you may find that, oh, geez, you know what? We need standard work. We need to sell, we need to create a cell for that product line, a one piece. Right now it's all in batch and we need to create a cell because my value stream may call out that I have to create a cell amongst these five processes that are all independent departments. I need to bring them together now and create a cell. Well, guess what? That's highlighted on my value stream plan. Well, what does that mean? That means I need to think about things like uh, cell design, standard work, uh, I need to think about things like uh, 5S and visual management. I need to think about problem solving, right? Because I'm going to have problems once I set this up. And if I don't have a good way to, uh, to understand how to solve problems. So, you know, 
don't think about this as what tool do I need to implement? Think about the objective and then think about all the different and sundry tools that you might look at as one Venn diagram, as one eclectic approach to solving whatever problems you're going after, okay? But if you got the mindset that I've got to implement lean, you're gonna do the wrong thing and you will implement lean, but at the end of the day, your CFO is gonna look at you and say, where's, where's the beef? And the, and the worst thing you want is your customer come back to you and say, hey, what's going on? You know, you guys have been doing lean for two years now and I don't see it. Your delivery still stinks, your lead times are lousy uh, and you raise my price, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna go somewhere else. So think about the objective first, what are you trying to accomplish, okay? And, uh, and then off those objectives, understand what parts of the business and what processes you need to affect. And then from there, move on from there. If that makes any sense, you know, that's, that's how I think about it anyway. No, it doesn't make sense. I was just trying to think if there was a, a stronger connection with, for example, standard work and a value stream map or anything. But, um, but I guess you need to go back to the basics and really think about, well, what are we actually trying to achieve? Well, think about standard work, though, as, uh, as quite frankly, Phil, think about standard work as sort of the um, one of the one of the, 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 the probably the main tool, if you want to talk about it as a tool that will truly identify the waste. You may think you know where the waste is now. And even in a value stream, you may not be able to get to that level of granularity. OK, because you really got to get granular in, in this. Right. And a value stream doesn't do that. OK. So uh, uh, you may say that the, the yield in that cell is you know, 80%, but you don't know why. You haven't really understood what the real root cause was at that point. You need to do a Kaizen. But if you don't put the standard work in place, you're not gonna see that line in the sand that you're not consistently hitting and you'll be chasing your tail all over the place. And that's why Ono put that on the bottom of the house as one of the core foundations of TPS, okay? So yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Cedric. Sorry, Mark. I, I will take advantage of the fact that okay. <laughs> Cedric, you were mute, you were um, muted, buddy. You were muted, Cedric. So if you have something, let me know. But I'm gonna Andrea's gonna go first. Okay, thanks. You want to know um, why? Because he's Italian and I'm Italian. That's why he's going first. So, <laughs> mafia yeah, stuff. <laughs> <that. laughs> no, you you mentioned about like how how um, Sander work and Kaizen like interlace within each other. There is a third uh, part in your lead house, which is a Junka. I don't want to open a whole other um, chapter here because that probably would deserve. Uh, a webinar of itself but what's the relationship like what do you i mean you mentioned okay you don't have a standard work uh do some kaizen and get there how does uh, a junka fit in these well again like I, like i said earlier you know you know all these all these concepts or tools are interrelated right so so <clears throat> In a way, you might think now Hajunka is a very specific uh, mechanics of Hajunka of how you do it and all that stuff, right? But taking it back a little bit and being a little bit higher level, think about Hajunka, which basically means level loading, okay? Um, in a sense, it's a way to standardize your business, okay? So, so with that being said, and, and by the way, the Hajunka schedule, the level loading schedule will be done over a time horizon. So people say, oh, we're seasonal, you know? We've got Christmas and Father's Day. Okay, yeah, I got that. But you'll, you'll set out a horizon. It might be three weeks, it might be a month, it might be one week. Okay, but you'll high junk a level load across a time horizon, all right? And then adjust as you go through, which means you adjust your supermarkets and your combines and all that when your tech time changes, right? But anyway, think about the standardization. And I always use this example. If you were gonna cook dinner for your family, let's say you have a family of four, uh, and great, every night you cook dinner, and then all of a sudden I say, hey, by the way, tonight we're coming over at 20 people. Oh my God. And oh, by the way, tomorrow, three of your people aren't gonna be there, so it's just gonna be you. Okay, so you gotta cook for yourself tomorrow. And oh yeah, the next day we got 10, and the next day we got 12, next day we got seven, next day we got 30, right? Good luck, right? 
you're probably a good cook, so it wouldn't matter, right? And we'll probably drink more wine than we eat, so it wouldn't matter. So uh, as long as you have the wine, see, batch is good in that regard, right? Wine, batch, that's good. Uh, forget about one piece flow. Um, uh, over inventory on that is good. But, but the point is that you can't run an operation that's got that kind of chaos in it with demand. So, so I wanna recognize that you've got to level on. This is one of my, my problems with uh, demand flow technology in the old days when that was out there popular. I don't hear much about it anymore. They said, ah, we don't need to level up. We can do anything we want. We can make three today or a hundred tomorrow. It doesn't matter. No, bull, you can't. You can't run an operation like that. And so that's why that playbook was really important too, by the way. You see how these tie in? Because that playbook says, hey, look, I'm gonna, if I run my cell with four people, well, I'm going to have a playbook that says, what happens when I need to run it with five? And what, what happens when I need to run it with three? Okay. So I'm already set. I don't have to recast my standard work and figure out where everybody goes and what they do. I just load the new charts in. Everybody's cross-trained. I just run it that way. But the level loading is really important to make sure that you don't, um, you don't have that kind of variation. And then, and then the other thing to think about is, what about your supply base? How's your suppliers, when you send them demand signals, and this is where a lot of people who do value stream mapping, the, one of the first things they do is they whack in a supplier combine. It's the last thing they should do because they haven't level loaded their own shop yet and, and, and provided consistent flow. And now they're saying, I'm gonna put a combine in with my suppliers and you're sending them erratic demand signals on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And then people walk away and say, oh, combine sucks, it doesn't work, you know? Yeah, it doesn't work because you know how to use it, okay? Because you can't, that should be the last thing you, one of the last things you do. And again, if you think about a value stream, you start with the customer and work your way backwards, right? Start in shipping, start in assembly, wherever you are and go backwards. And ultimately you get to the supply base, your, your, you know, your suppliers with your, your, your supplier combines, if you will. And that's the last thing because you've now really leveled off the flow into your factory and now you've got that consistent flow going through where you're sending, now you can commit to a supplier and say to yourself, okay, geez, you know, our demand over the next six months, we'll commit to you for 60,000 units, but you know, and, and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna level load and here's our thinking about, about that. And I can give them that level loaded plan. So he can plan, right? But if I'm going to him every day and saying, hey, today it's 50, tomorrow I need hundred. Call him up at three o'clock in the afternoon. I need 500 tomorrow. Good luck, you're not gonna work. So that's why Ono thought that that Hijunka was a really a way to standardize, right? That's really what it was. Okay, do you see the, the, the relationship? So, yeah, yeah. Like, like providing the right environment for standardization to happen basically, right? I mean, you can standardize if you, if you, if you, if you have 20 people uh, eating at your place today and one tomorrow. Yeah, well, you know, the beauty about reducing your lead time is the the lower you reduce your lead time, the more react, the more you're able to react, right? You, you, you're yep. more able to react uh, in accordance with because your lead times are lower, right? Or you know, quicker, faster, shorter, um, and so that's a good thing. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, if you can really get to the ultimate lead time, you won't ever need a forecast, okay? <laughs> but but uh, but that's not reality, really, and and. Uh, and so that's more theoretical than anything else. Maybe not helpful, but but the lower your lead times go, the less you're going to be a, a victim of those deviations. You know, so if that makes any sense. Great. But, but make sure make sure you batch the wine, though. Okay, don't don't go far. I will. That. Promise. I, I want to see very low inventory turns in your wine cellar. Okay. <laughs> okay. Promise. Okay. Cedric, my man, good to see you. Hey, Mark, how you doing? I'm doing good. Boy, look at all that stuff behind yeah. you. You're like uh, doing all kinds Yeah, of man, you know, this is my uh, studio now. So. Oh, my God. Hey, could you talk briefly to sustain? You know, any, any tips always helps when we're talking about putting this in, sustaining standard work. You know, Tim taught, Clem taught me a lot. You taught me a lot. Would you, could you briefly just cover some points on what it takes to sustain something like this? Well, well, first of all, um, and again, the, the story I told you guys about Nakao telling me, Deluzio saying you don't understand standard work. We, didn't keep, we took our eye off the ball, Cedric, okay? We let the cell kind of creep in the way everybody, nobody's going to watch in that, right? And, and uh, 
nobody was really watching, assuring that we were holding ourselves to the standard, okay? So it's almost like, and that really is like the team leader or the supervisor of the cell to make sure that people are working in accordance. Now, and if you, like I, was at, I was at a client the other day, we set up cells, uh, not the other day, a couple of weeks ago, we set up cells and uh, one piece flow, nice cells. You'd like the cells, I know you would. Um, and we had standard work and all that. And I looked down at the cell and I said, man, that operator, she's making 20 pieces at once and nobody said anything to her, okay? Okay, no, she's making 20. No, she probably thinks it's faster and all the reasons what you've probably been through as well, right? But nobody called her on it, okay? Which tells me there's a miss on how we train the, uh, the supervisors to manage the cell, okay? Just let her do it, right? So sustainability isn't all that complex, really. It's just making sure you're adhering to what you say you're gonna do. That's it, okay? And, um, but if you allow that operator to do that and then the next operator says, hey, shit, he's making 20 at a time. You know, and by the way, this is why I don't like piece rate. Okay, one of the reasons why. Okay, we don't want that. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden, before you know it, you know, you don't have flow anymore. So she's making 20, and then the operator next to her is standing there waiting. Okay. And then everybody thinks, well, that's a good thing because now she can process those 20. Well, we're not doing 20 piece flow, we're doing one piece flow, you know. And, and then when you start seeing other things like allowing operators, to deviate from their work sequence. Okay, so in other words, yeah, it's okay that Mary goes to get those parts. No, it's not okay for Mary to get those parts. Just like it's not okay for a NASCAR driver to leave the track and go get a coffee. It doesn't work, okay? So um, so it's, it's really more a supervisory adherence type of thing. But the thing is, if you don't make the standard work visual, which I think is a real key, then you're not gonna know you have deviation. And if you don't clearly define your standard whip, and you allow whip to build somewhere and you don't recognize that as an abnormality, that's not good either, right? Now, the other, the other part about this is the hour by hour boards that you and I talked about a long time ago. You know, uh, you know am I really hitting my daily rate? You know, and if I'm not, do I know why, right? If I'm, and, and normally when I don't hit it, it's not because the operators are screwing off, it's because either we mismanaged the cell or, or in the load, if you will, of the operators, or we, uh, we, we asked them to do something that wasn't called for in the work sequence, or we asked them to do something, yeah, or, 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 or we have an issue that caused a problem. And so, so in a lot of respects, what you'll see is like, let's say a machine goes down, right? Um, uh, well, if a machine goes down, does that mean the operator right before that person can still build? No, they have to stop, right? Well, why? Well, because you just built up a bunch of inventory that could have quality problems that we don't know about until it gets assembled, let's say, right? You know, that kind of thing. So it really comes down to that type of thing. Now, Clem's on the line. I don't know, Clem, if you have any comments on that. Uh, unmute yourself there, buddy. Wait a minute, you gotta, gotta unmute yourself. Are you speaking to Clem or me? Okay. Clem, I was gonna ask Clem his comments. On hey, it. Clem. So, hey, Clem, you're, you're muted. I like that. I'll be him. Is that unmuted now? You're good now. Okay. Hello, Cedric. <laughs> uh, sustain. My simplest example. When I was with Timex, and I'm talking 1973, the CEO had two reports on his desk every morning. One was... What is the whip in units compared to standard globally? That globally, this is a company with 35,000 people with 35 plants in 30 countries. And the other one he looked at every day was what's the length of my lead time through the process in days? And the CEO is looking at those two things every day. Everyone below him knows he's looking at this every day and they don't have to wait for the phone call. My, what, what's my point? Going back to one of the questions that Andrea asked earlier, uh, you know, what are your objectives? They made it very clear that if they drove those two things, the rest of the stuff would happen. And that's how they created sustain. One last thought. People said, well, what's the right number? 
you know, you're driving these two things. What's the right number? And his answer was better than yesterday forever. Thanks, Clem. Thanks, Clem. See, Clem, see Senator, you, you thought, Senator, you thought you had Clem out of your system and all of a sudden he comes back, you know, it's like. Yeah, he, he just won't go away. Like a boomerang, you know. <laughs> won't go away. <laughs> like a boomerang. Uh, anybody else? Okay, well, I guess, uh, do we have anybody? Hey, Mark, Ricardo here. Hey, Ricardo. From Mexico City. Uh, here in Mexico, we all, um, we all have uh, a lot of uh, family companies where they want, of course, they want productivity, they want efficiency, they want, um, uh, on, and they want to increase revenues and growth. But, uh, and they hire, uh, Lean practitioners or black belts or, or continuous improvement managers. Uh, and when they hire and they are starting to work there and starting to uh, improve uh, the processes, they are not supporting the, these people's or these efforts. What would be your advice or your advices for these uh, uh, continuous improvement managers uh, to deal with uh, directors that are not uh, putting the effort on supporting all these strategies. So you're, you're talking about people <laughs> within your company that are comp continuous improvement directors or, yeah, leader, or the leadership? The leadership, the, the operations uh, directors or the CEOs, they hire the continuous improvement directors and the continuous improvement managers, but these CEOs or these operations directors don't uh, don't support the the efforts that uh, that they hired. Yeah, well, that's, that's, by the way, that's a very common that's a very common uh, uh, situation, right? And uh, what what I, I I would say to you, well, for you know, when we work with a client, we first start with a boot camp with executives to make sure they see. Here's the thing: you can get into these tools all you want, but if it's not if these if this if the change in your company, the improvements, the kaizens, and all that are not done in the context of the fundamental principles. You know, like some people may say, well, a single minute exchange of data doesn't apply to my company because we don't have, okay, fine. But it doesn't mean lean doesn't apply, right? I heard people say standard work doesn't apply to my company, uh, but so lean doesn't apply. No, what does apply to every company are the principles. I don't care what company you are, pharmaceutical, log, I mean, fracking, fracking company I worked at. Uh, worked at uh, all kinds of manufacturing, administrative, uh, financial. The principles are the same for a lemonade stand as they are for a jet engine manufacturer. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, the principles are the same. Now, if your leadership does not understand those principles, and they say they will, by the way, but the real way to tell is if they really understand it is if they actually behave in accordance with those principles, then you're all set. If they, if, they, if they behave under those principles, you're all set. But if they, where you have the conflict is usually where they'll tell you they'll support this because they want the result, but they won't yeah. want to change what they do because what they've got, what, what they've gotten to those roles of leadership by doing traditional things that are no longer uh, valid if you bring in the principles of lean, okay? Uh, and, and they don't want to change. So they want everybody else to change. And probably my guess would be that they're only thinking about lean in the context of manufacturing. They're not thinking about lean in the context of the enterprise. So that means that the sales departments are going to do uh, dysfunctional things like taking orders at the end of the month at the last day. So they get their bonus. Uh, accounting is still going to insist on building inventory for absorption credit. Uh, and you're going to have all that purchase pr purchasing still going to buy in big bulks because they want a favorable purchase price variance. You know, all those dysfunctional things are going to go on, but they're going to look at you and say, oh, but do lean and improve and get me all these great results. It doesn't work. Okay. So if they're not in understanding and behave in the context of the principles, it, it, I don't know what to tell you. It, you know, it's like, it's like putting a square peg in a round hole. Okay. 
and, and, and it's really hard to do then because you're not going to be successful, uh, quite frankly, because uh, uh, so, so what do you do? I don't know. Um, look for another job. I don't know. Uh, but, but, but no, but seriously, I mean, you know, I mean, if they're not going to, and, and so many people, that's why I wrote my book Flatline. I talk about the five things that you have to do uh, to actually get back on track because everybody calls me and says, Hey, we've been doing lean for 10 years and we flatline. That's why I call my book flatline. Right. Um, and, and so flatline basically is uh, all about the continual stories I've heard like yours over the last, you no, know, I've been doing lean horizons now for almost to the day, 20 years. Okay. 20 years. I've been hearing the same stories. Mm -hmm. It's almost exactly the same. Okay. But you know, Mark, and interesting that, that I've been in, in big companies also, and uh, they have uh, uh, deployed very large programs related to to lean or related to, uh, let's say, uh, production systems or management systems. And uh, they start with all these massive training for all the people, for all the managers and certifications and everything. But it ends on just on checking the box that they got the certification and they got the, uh, uh, I don't know, they got the elements covered, let's say having a, a, a process already documented, a job description documented and, and all that stuff. And they just check the box, but they don't necessarily leave, leave what it's supposed to be uh, in place. So what happens there? What happens well, that, when there's a lot? Well, that is yeah, that's what you call check the box lean. And you know, one of the, one of the regrets I have when I we put the Danher business system together, is, and Clem was helping me with this, is we put in a certification, a black belt, like a, a you know master black belt certification program for DBS. I wish I've never done that, and I'll tell you why. Because it gives the notion, and I didn't realize it at the time, it gives the notion that you've arrived, that you've got your black belt and you've arrived, and there's no more learning to be had, right? And and so. Uh, there's to certain people, there's a level of arrogance to say, I got my black belt. Well, you can't tell me what to do, you know, and, and, and it's wrong. I, I would never have done that. I would, if I went back, I never would have put that in place at Danaher. Okay. Uh, I also don't think uh, being certified as a company is a good thing. Why? Whether it's Shingo, and I'm a member of the Shingo Hall of Fame, if you will, but, you know, and I, but I, I don't agree with certifications. AME, uh, I mean, any, any, any industry week, whatever, because it give, I, I had one client one time, he had me walk through his factory and I'm walking through and very good, by the way, very good factory, but there were a lot of things I, you know, I, I brought to his attention and he got kind of upset with uh, the president got kind of upset with my feedback to him and his team. And he says, hang on for a minute. He goes into his office. He comes back and he puts his shingle price on the desk. He goes, now talk to me. And I looked at him. I said, well, you know what? It looks like you've arrived. There's nothing I could do here. And I left. I left. I said, have a nice day. Okay. Nothing I could do. And it wasn't your factory I needed to move. It was your mind I needed to move. And then I'm going to move it. You already arrived with that award. Okay. So I don't like awards. I don't like certifications for people or companies. It's just the way I think. Right. And, and, and I would have done that differently. Right. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't just don't like that. Now, now here's the thing. You use the word program. Okay. Whether you realize or not, it's not a good thing. You say, oh, these companies did program. If they think about this as a program, it's a loser. Okay. Because you've got to think about this as a cultural change for everybody, not just manufacturing, not just engineering. You know, some companies look at this as an engineering endeavor. No, it's not. Right. Okay. And, 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 uh, oh yeah, engineering has got to be involved, of course, but but it's not just an engineering endeavor. It's a mindset. And, and, and it really goes back into something that, you know, I talked to my colleagues about like Colleen uh, Sapelsa and, and David Thompson and, and John Foster and, 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 uh, and, 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 and Patrick uh, Ross out of Australia and Steve Feltovich. The respect for people part of this thing is a big deal. And it sounds like a consultant talking when you talk about this stuff, right? And it's like, ah, that's just soft stuff. Just give me the product. But a lot of these people think that lean is something I can go to the store and buy, like a refrigerator, like a refrigerator, mm -hmm. plug it in, and 30 minutes later, I got <laughs> full drinks and I'm done, right? But I didn't change anything that I did. Oh, I, I want to you know, spend a little money on a, on a refrigerator. 
They think lean is like that. I'm going to hire a bunch of lean guys, lean black belts, and they'll give me those results that Danaher got. No, no, it's not going to work that way. Okay, if you don't change what you're doing and how you're thinking as a leader, it's not going to work. It's not just not a program where you just plug and play it and go do a bunch of Kaizans and everything gets better. It doesn't work that way. And it goes back to Cedric's point about sustainability, you know? And so, uh, so, so that's, that's, that's why it's got to be an enterprise wide cultural shift, not just an engineering endeavor, you know? So I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, but you know, here in Mexico, we say, we say many times that they are doing cocoa wash. That means uh, cocoa wash. So because they they say they are doing it, but they are not doing it. So that's why I mentioned well, the program. You, you want to cut through all the you want to cut through all the crap? Ask your customer how they think you're doing. Yep. Forget about what so, you say about your what they say about themselves. Ask your customer. If your customer is happy, then I'll walk away and say, "Okay, you got it." Okay, but I bet you any money they're not. Mm -hmm. Not really. Are they? Are they? Are the no. customers happy? No, they are not happy. So well, there you go. Not happy. It doesn't and matter what some say. CI guy says, some black belt, some VP, some president. It doesn't matter yeah. what they say. It doesn't matter. I agree. So. so. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Hey, Mark. I I don't mean to keep everyone here. So, like, if we, if you want to end, it's it's fine for me. No, no, no. I'm fine. I'll spend I, all day. I don't care. If if you if you if you want, I I wanted to ask something about um, let's say a quite opposite situation of the one Ricardo is now. I I guess you know that um, you know Larry Kalp is is leading GE now, mm -hmm. and it's it, he like he got implanted in a company that I think was not um, was not um, not very lean to begin with. Uh, so how does that work in reverse? Like having 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 your like the CEO uh, there that is the first ambassador of Lean, but the company may uh, be not in let's say in the best readiness. Can can you like spend two words on how you see that? Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I know Larry very well. I worked with him very closely for geez, I don't know, over a decade. Yeah, I, and uh, <laughs> I know, I know, and and. Uh, and uh, I also have been, uh, GE's been a client of mine, uh, not of late, but of, uh, since 2005. So I, I, I've been all around GE and I, and uh, they've got some unbelievable people there. Some of the best lean people, matter of fact, I'll mention their name, Todd Waterman and John Boucher, some two of the best lean people I know. Okay. Uh, phenomenal. But I remember Todd told me after we started at Danaher in the late eighties with Shinka Jitsu, we were the first ones at Jake Break to bring Shin in and started the modern lean movement, really. That's where the spark happened, where I was working with George Conus, for George Conesaker and Art Byrne. Um, Todd told me that they brought in Shin Gajitsu in, uh, at Aircraft Engines up in Rutland, Rutland Vermont. Uh, I think where they make blades up there. And, uh, and John and, and, and Todd were running that. And, and uh, they brought Nakao in, okay? And they're, both of those guys are big Nakao disciples. And like me, we want to go and visit him just to have a beer with him. That's how much we think about him. Um, and, and Todd told me that because the Six Sigma bandwagon was going, he said, if Jack Welch ever found out we were doing lean with Nakao, we probably would have been fired. Okay. So when we started working with GE, Todd called me in and John would say they were in the corporate office now. And we did something on retail credit cards and we took a 63 day lead time down to one day. And they, they, uh, they, they actually realized $216 million additional revenue because of that. And it was a big deal. It got written up in Harvard Business Review. They presented it at their investor conference. And then Jeff Emmel said, okay, we're doing lean now. We're not doing Six Sigma anymore. I'll go, oh boy, okay. But every lean, pro <laughs> but every lean project has to give us $50 million of results. Oh my God, you know. So, um, so anyway, you know what happened to Jeff, and 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 then and then um, um, uh, Larry came along after a very successful stint at Danaher. So not only, so I, I Larry and I worked for George Sherman, who was a phenomenal CEO, uh, and then and then he groomed Larry, and then Larry took over uh, for Danaher for you know 10, 12 years, whatever it was, and then he went on the board for GE, and then uh, then became the first outside. 
CEO of uh, GE, first outsider in its history. It was a big deal, right? And so, so does Larry understand? Yeah, of course uh, he does. Uh, uh, the, the, the real pro issue is gonna be not what you do with cells and manufacturing and flow and supply chains. Oh yeah, that's important, don't get me wrong. It's the mindset. And this is to go back to the principles I talked to Ricardo about the mindset, because in the, in the past, people really were changing jobs every two years and they were more interested in how, what their career was all about than the work that was going on under them. So a lot of, a lot of people doing PowerPoint presentations for, for their boss to prove their worth. Right. And there wasn't always that team uh, effort. Right. Uh, because a lot of individual, a lot of great people, by the way, phenomenal people that work there, right? Um, so Larry's got an issue now where he's got to change the whole, I will just put it under the context of uh, respect for people, okay? If you don't change that, and if you don't really welcome not only your employee's input and have the ability to tell the emperor he has no clothes on, okay, it's not going to work. Nobody had the ability to do that with Jack Welch. Matter of fact, once Six Sigma got in, that was it. That couldn't change. That was it. It's, that's what how you had to improve. There was no give and take there, right? And then Jack had this thing about top grading where the bottom 10% of every year got lopped off and got fired. To me, the most disrespectful thing you could have done because everybody, uh, somebody at Danner, an executive at Danner, when I was putting together DBS, they, he wanted to put that in to the DBS system, top grading, right? And I said, no, we're not going to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna, bottom 10% every year, we're going to upgrade our... I looked at him, I said, maybe we should top grade you. You're the one that hired them. Maybe you're the one should be top graded, okay? Well, no, I don't, you know. So I didn't put it... <laughs> yes, he wanted to put that as a tool under the... D, because DPS was more than just TPS. It was a lot of other things, too. So, so, um, so that mindset is what Larry's got to work on. Right and 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 continue to work on right to change that mindset and whether or not you know I do talk to people. So, sorry, Mark. Just 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 a clarification. When you when you say, um, I mean, people have to be able to say the emperor is naked. Um, you mean about the CEO or you mean about intermediate levels like everybody. my boss? Is everybody, naked. everybody, including the CEO. Yep, everybody, and not be shot for it. Because then what, all you're going to do is you're going to continue. You know, the whole essence of work, you know, what we talked about today with standard work is exposing problems. You're not going to do that because you're going to get penalized if you expose problems. There were times where I knew guys got fired because they didn't make a quarter. One quarter they missed, they were out, right? It's like, wow, you got to be kidding me, you know? And, uh, and so, um, so everybody, anybody to be open and blameless to say, hey, look, Andrea, I don't like your wine. Okay, <laughs> uh, that won't happen. By the way, I know, but uh, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. If you if you can't if you don't have the courage to speak the truth, the, the the ramifications of not speaking the truth are worse than not speaking it. Okay, but if everybody takes that 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 attitude of 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 just not not voicing their opinion, then you can't blame anybody but yourself. So. So that's why I think the barrier, it's a cultural thing that he's really got to work on more than anything, you know, so. In, in the small niche I see, I totally agree with you. Yep. Yeah. Mm, yeah, easy. I should Not say easy. that. Let, let me add on this, Andrea, that if uh, if the CEO is your ambassador, you, you're in a very good position because you can be his right hand and coach him personally and make him like doing the walk the talk thing to, to this middle management. If you uh, uh, achieve that, you are in a very good position. Well, see, see if, 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 you, if you don't have that in a guy like Larry, then maybe you're back in what you're doing, right, in, in, in Ricardo. So, you know, it, it's hard when the top person does not either understand or truly support what's going on, even though they say they do. What they really support, like when somebody calls me and says, CEO says, hey, Mark, we flatline and we want to do DBS. Well, first thing I say, no, you can't do DBS. That's for Dana. You can create your own process, right? But do you really want to do a DBS type of transformation or do you want Dana her's results? Which one is it? And most of the time, they'll say the, la the, the, the former, but they really mean the latter. They want the results. That's what they want. 
without without thinking about how they're going to really have to change. That's the problem. So, yeah. So, I think Clement is speaking. Clement, you're on mute. Clement, you're still on mute. <laughs> Clement, you're still on mute. There you are. Can you hear me? Now, can you hear me, Andrea? Yes. Yep, yeah, I can. I can. Okay. I, some of the things go back, the roots are so deep. Uh, I, uh, short version, in the 1960s, I was a supplier to Jet, General Electric, Pratt Whitney, Rolls Royce, Pigeons, that's my experimental blades of things. And I got to see how those corporations acted. And General Electric was almost impossible to make suggestions to. The Pratt Whitney would listen, Rolls Royce would listen. There was a culture even then. I also was engaged at that time in the nuclear business. And I got to see GE Nuclear versus Westing in those days, Westinghouse, combustion, same thing. My point is some of those cultural things precede Jack Welch. Jack Welch was raised in them. <laughs> okay. So Larry's chore is a big one. And you've really got to pick the battles very carefully where you're going for the thing that has the best chance for success may not necessarily initially be the biggest bang uh, un unless and until this Larry and the people below Larry and the people below that make the shift. Meanwhile, what, the, what do we work on? Work on the ones where you get the best shot and may not be the one that you see as the biggest opportunity, but it may be the one that you see the biggest chance for success. Thanks, Clem. Well, let's Thanks, see, Clem. any any other questions that we're getting on to, uh, actually three hours, so uh, that's okay. Um, uh, but any 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 other questions or comments or perspectives on this? Now, but, and I remember, I'm gonna be loading this whole thing up to uh, YouTube uh provided no technical difficulties and uh so it'll be there and I'll, I'll put the link out on linkedin so everybody has the you know the link for the youtube thing uh but let me ask any other questions uh out there i see adam is such he has a nice little suit on there in his picture boy i tell you you're that looks nice um anybody else jim kenyon from an hr perspective you have anything to say Jim used to work at Danaher with me in the HR. He was in HR and saw his share of Kaizen's. For me, just thank you very much, Mark. Very illustrative thing. Yeah, Mark, okay. thank you so much for setting this up. It was awesome, really. Good, good. And you guys let me know if there's any questions, okay? And, uh, you, you know, my, uh, uh, did I give you my email? Well. I think my email's in the, in, the, in the deck, so you'll see it. Uh, yeah, let me know if there's any questions and, uh, and uh, every, I'll be glad to answer any questions, uh, you know, virtually like this, except for Andrea, because uh, we got to do that personally in uh, Italy, so. When you want. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks guys. Thanks for your contributions. I appreciate it and gals. Bye. I'm going to close. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks. Have a good day. You bet.